Hello everyone, welcome to another stream. Today I am going to be reviewing a video by Caption Christianity in which he is interviewing uh, two physicists. Uh, let's see, who are they again? Tom McLeish and Dave Hutchings. So Tom is this guy here and then Dave is this guy on the right here, I believe. Um, and they are, well, I mean, there's a broader discussion that they begin with about the relationship between science and what is science and so forth, which I don't have too much to comment on. But the part of the video that I want to review is sort of the second half in which they talk about why science needs God, which obviously is, is sort of the title of the video. And uh, this is just an example of the this sort of argument that apologists well, at least some apologists make. Um, I think I've seen it a bit more often these days, which is essentially that science doesn't make any sense under an atheistic worldview, or indeed the stronger claim is that science only makes sense under a Christian worldview because you need some sort of idea of the uniformity of nature or a designer who made nature uniform or something like that. And that's required to you know, even think in scientific terms and begin to carry out science. Um, or the phrase that they use is science rests on theistic underpinnings or something like that. Um, we'll see how they articulate that in a moment. Um, so that's the reason I'm reviewing this as a sort of example of that argument. Um, this argument has always really bothered me because I think that it's just, well, it's it's false <laughs> uh, it, it, in that it's not true that historically science arose because of um, sort of peculiar Christian assumptions. And then there's it's false in another sense in which the, it's just un, it's not true that you need particular theological uh, or e even philosophical foundations to, um, uh, to to do science or to understand science. It's it's sort of not even clear what that claim might mean. So it's sort of false at different levels, as we'll I'll discuss uh, in due course. Um, and also, I think it's just it it, it distorts the history of science, um, which is a very interesting uh, subject in itself, uh, and one that's as they point out fairly misunderstood. And um, uh, also, I think it gives people wrong impressions about the philosophy of science and um, it sort of distorts the picture that we have today and, and sort of real problems that science faces in, in being uh, accepted and understood appropriately. So, so I think that it's sort of, I guess, harmful in a number of respects, apart from just being a bad argument. So that's why I'm discussing this. Um, so I think we're going to go through most of the rest of this video here. Um, and at various points, I will pause and make some comments and bring up some uh, articles and so forth as we go through. So let's make a start then. That would be awful, but we have done this for science. And I think what we need to do is to undo, undo it. So related to this idea that just the average person is, is kind of uh, engaged in scientific reasoning. Uh, so if science needs God, then why did the scientific method only come about around 400 years ago? Any, anyone who wants to take that one? Yeah, well, the thing is, it didn't, and that's one of the that's one of the conspiracy theories, come lies, come twisted bits of history that, that Dave has written his book to. to no, this is, um, people were doing science for, for start. Don't remember we already we already explained, haven't we, that there is no such thing called the scientific method. Okay, does it? Look, I, I'm a fellow of a national academy. I'm a professional scientist. If there were a scientific method, I'd have done a course in it, right? I'd even have taught a course in it. No. Okay, so that deals with that one. Uh, there, there's just what scientists do. I should comment on this. So th this isn't really the focus of what I'm going to be talking about, but this idea of a scientific method is quite an interesting topic in the philosophy of science. And it's still the case that particularly first year students are taught a very simplified form of the scientific method, which is usually like, you know, you make a hypothesis, you design an experiment, you test hypothesis um, by gathering data, and then you then either falsify it or fail to falsify it. And then that feeds back into making a new hypothesis. Um, so many people, if they've done science at high school or even uni level would have um, seen something like that. Now that is not the scientific method, right? That is a highly simplified form of reasoning that science scientists do use, but it's not the only form that they use. And it, it doesn't really work like that even, even you know, when scientists are using um, experiments to confirm or refute a hypothesis, which is not what they always do anyway. So. Um, so this is a valid point. There's really no such thing as the scientific method and there's different views on exactly what one can say about that. Um, it, again, that's not exactly the topic that I want to discuss this evening. So I just wanted to flag that and saying that I broadly agree, although I don't think that the way, uh, what's his name again? Uh, Tom um, articulates that is just as an argument from authority. Well, you know, if it existed, he would know about it. It's not like, it doesn't really explain the philosophy behind it. Uh, but anyway, so that's fine. Um, let's come back though to, remember that the camera's original question is if science requires or like is dependent on christian perspectives or theology then why is it so recent say you know 400 years ago uh and and tom's response here is that it it didn't 
uh, developed only 400 years ago. So let's see how he's going to continue that thought. Um, uh, no, it's, you're absolutely right, Cam. Of course, science has changed over the centuries, but we can go right back to Thales, to the ancient Greeks. Um, I've said, mentioned I've spent a lot of time working on, on the medievalists, um, right from uh, the 8th or 9th centuries um, to extraordinary characters called Robert Grostes, who was a bishop of Lincoln in the, the 1200s, who wrote extraordinary things about colour and light, and clearly did early experiments on, on the, uh, the, the, the optical effects um, that early lenses, uh, lenses had. So for one thing, um, it's the scientific method wasn't suddenly invented 400 years ago in the early modern period. Now, sure, uh, 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 a science was enhanced by certain experimental methods, um, but in fact, you know, some of those methods were um, the imaginative steps needed to make them could be traced once again to aspects of Christian theology, to the furnaces of their imaginations. A historian called Peter Harrison, who was at Oxford, is now... So I need to pause again here. So I, I don't doubt that this guy's done s some good work and that he discussed it a bit earlier in the video, but it, th th this presentation of the history, I think is highly misleading. So it's very hard to answer the question like, when was science developed? Because it's it, it, it's just really hard to pin down what you mean by science. Um, people have always, as long as civilization has existed, people have always been investigating the natural world through one means or another. Astronomy is probably the oldest organized form of this that we've been able to see um and this goes right back to you know sumeria essentially the babylonians and so forth um a bit after that um but is that science well i would say no and and i think many scholars would also say that that's not really science in the way that we would currently think about it although in a sense it is science if you just define that as like studying the natural world um and and this is where the complexity comes in because it, I don't think it's sufficient just to point to examples of people studying the natural world and finding interesting results and writing about it and calling that science. Um, of course, it's hard to be definitive there because, well, you know, what is your definition of science? Well, I, don't, I, I, I don't really, they, they talked about that a bit earlier. I don't really have a particular definition of science that I'm wedded to. I think it's extremely difficult to define. Um, so all I want to say here is that I, I think that it's, to say that science was not developed 400 years ago is misleading because although it's true that there are many, like the history of science is, is long and complicated, there were there was a very distinctive period that occurred in Europe roughly in the 17th century, and in fact that this is what they're going to appeal to later, um, where what we now call, or that I guess th that formed the birth of what we now call science and the scientific method. Um, and there's a confluence of sort of new ideas, perspectives, and approaches that occurred around this time, which I'll, I'll come back to in a little bit, but they included the, me the mechanical philosophy, um, experimental thought, um, and uh, particularly the work of particular people like um, Boyle and Galileo and and uh, Francis Bacon and Newton, um, all occurring within the sort of roughly 17th century period that, that really sort of uh, triggered the beginnings of what we think of as modern science. Um, and also, an important point here was concept was the beginnings of the conceptualization of science as a distinct discipline because previously it was just like people did so what they they studied the natural world but these were it wasn't really thought of as a distinct discipline it was thought of as just part of philosophy or astronomy is just kind of its own thing just something people did or as part of theology um as it was in the medieval world in in europe um and for a long time what we now call science was called um natural philosophy um, and it was during the 17th century where natural philosophy sort of really came in its own, developed a particular set of approaches. And then um, over the course of the subsequent couple of centuries, say from the 17th through the 19th century, developed into a professionalized modern uh, autonomous discipline of science. So, yes, you, you can't just simplistically say, you know, science was just invented all of a sudden in the 17th century. No, that's obviously not correct. People have done sort of investigation of the natural world for a long time but there was a very significant period of transformation in the 17th century um, and i feel like here he's trying to downplay that because it seems to hurt the narrative that sort of christian theological beliefs were critical for the development of science because you know europe had had christian theological beliefs for let's say at least since the fourth century um you know when christianity became uh, predominant in in the west um and if, if it's only like 1,200 years later when we're getting the birth of modern science, that there seems to be a problem here if you're going to say that theolo certain theological beliefs are the cause of it. But if those beliefs predated the effect by 1,200 years, there seems to be a – like that doesn't really seem to work. So it, it, like it seems like what Tom needs to say here is, well, no, actually, science didn't originate um, in the 17th century. Modern science, again, the way we understand it. But 
it must have originated much earlier than that. But the, th the problem with that line of argument, again, as we'll see a bit more later, is that if he wants to say that, if he wants to identify, say, pre 17th century um, investigation of the natural world as science, um, which I would call a broader notion of science, then he can do that. The problem then is that you can't identify it with like when you would want to say that it would come because of Christian theology, because then it goes all the way back through ancient Greece and probably to you know ancient Babylon and before, plus in other cultures as well. Again, we'll talk about later. So I, the, the problem, the fundamental problem with this argument is it doesn't work chronologically. If you go with a more narrow notion of what is science, then I'd say it, it emerged in 17th century Europe. Not all of a sudden it had antecedents, but in the way we understand it, there were significant developments then. And in that case, it postdates you know Christian theology by at least 1,200 years in terms of when Christianity became pre preeminent. On the other hand, if you want to take a broader notion of what science is, well, then it began at the very least with the ancient Greeks, uh, hundreds of years before Christianity even existed, and probably you'd go back even further than that. So whichever notion you adopt, it, it just doesn't work. Um, you, you can't say that it, it was triggered by the adoption of particular theological beliefs. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that theological beliefs weren't important. Uh, and it's still even possible that you may require certain theological beliefs to like ground science because, I mean, it could have existed without being properly grounded, um, which uh, something we'll talk about later. So, so this doesn't, what I've said is not sufficient to demolish all of his argument, but I think that it's a big problem already that the dates just don't line up. And, and what he's saying here, I think, is really unsatisfactory. Now, there's more to be fleshed out in terms of the details here, which we'll come to in a moment or in a little bit. But at the outset, the, the story is not making a lot of sense because the chronology doesn't line up here. Now in Australia, he's done a lot of work, work on this and meticulous um, uh, uh, source, source work and has shown that what we now call the experimental method, what do you think about it? You take it for granted, but little parenthesis here, it's very counterintuitive. Why would you expect the experimental method to teach you about nature? Here's why not. Experiments have one or two components, they're radically oversimplified, um, uh, and they're and they're and they're circumscribed. They're, they're little micro worlds cut off from the, the rest of the world, and they're oversimplified. Why should something as disconnected and as simplified as an experiment teach us anything about the complex and connected real world? It, it yeah, my understanding is that this was an argument made by some ancient Greek philosophers. I'm not an expert in that, but I, I understand that that was made by some philosophers then as an argument for not relying on experiments. Um, and, and this seems this sort of general thinking seems to have been um, relevant in other cultures as well, but, uh, in, in uh, Chinese philosophy as well, um, as, as a reason to not really trust experiment. And the thing is, people still make this argument today, right? They still both scientists, philosophers, and just sort of laypersons that, well, you can't really trust experiments because they're so artificial um, and they don't tell you about sort of how the how the world really is. They just tell you about this sort of artificial scenario and they that's particularly prevalent, I'd say, in psychology. So th the point there is that there's not like this overarching fact of the matter as to like experiments good or experiments bad. It, it sort of depends on what question you're asking and, and um, how you're approaching that and the design of the experiment and so forth. So it's not like people never did experimental work. It's just that Throughout a lot of history, experimental results were not particularly well trusted, and they weren't very uh, pre they weren't very prevalent or predominant. And I think uh, one of the reasons is that it was just they lacked the technical sophistication to make the measurements as precise enough to make experiments uh, very useful. Of course, that's not the only explanation, but I think that was a factor. Anyway, again, we'll, we'll come to that in a little bit. But so he he makes a good point here that yes, uh, the notion of conducting experiments is actually kind of um, counterintuitive, and there are like reasons against it and that's i think a reason why it took a long time to really become preeminent um but well we'll see the bud it needs a huge leap of faith with a small f to believe the experimental method would work the guy who indicated how one might get that faith is francis bacon and where he got it from was a story actually that theologians have been telling for a long long time which is that it, you can only have faith this would work if, if you believe that god made it that way not only made the world understandable but gave us a sort of ladder to climb that had small steps. And the small steps of the ladders are those things called experiments. You'd only expect it if God had designed us that way and entrusted us with a task that we could actually do. If you don't believe that, you wouldn't believe that experimental method could possibly work. Uh, so, and of course, so the answer is it arises after a sufficient amount of theological thinking um, in the Christian Latin West and in, and in the Greek East. And I have to say, this is, there's, there's some really important uh, input here from um, uh, 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 Arab uh, thinkers in the early Middle, Middle, Middle Ages too, around around how one could do this this godly science. Dave, I feel like you've got some things that you want to say here. Okay, so the, I, I think I want to hear Dave before going into some more of the detail about that, but just a few initial comments. I think it's just rubbish that you have to have faith in, in order to use experiments. It It's a hypothesis, right, to say that, well, let's hypothesize that we can gain 
you know, uh, reliable, testable, useful, whatever you want to say, true knowledge about X field by conducting experiments. You can you can say, well, let's see if it works. You do the experiments, you form a theory, you can test it in other contexts, experimental or non-experimental. You can see if it works. Even absent any fancy philosophy, you, you just you don't need a faith in 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 the, in the sense that I think he means it. Now, if you just mean faith in the sense of like enough trust or confidence that it might work. Well, we're sure, but that's the kind of faith you need when you go to sleep at night and get up in the morning and go to get the milk out of the fridge. You, you know, you have faith that the refrigerator, refrigerator kept running over night while you were asleep and, and your milk didn't go off overnight, right? That's because you're not sure of that. Like, you can't be certain of that. But, you know, <laughs> that's faith in a sense, right? It's trust based on evidence, which they'll say later that that's what faith is. But in a sense, that's sort of frivolous because, like, we have that sort of faith all the time in pretty much anything. I mean, in different proportions, right? You know, when you sit down on a chair, you have faith that it's not just going to collapse under your weight. <laughs> well, most of the time, I suppose. Maybe there are some chairs for which that's not true. But, I mean, you, you know, you, you can go on and on about this. But I, I don't think that that's faith in a relevant or sort of theologically interesting sense. It's just the basic sort of trust in the absence of perfect knowledge. Um, so, yeah, sure. Okay, you need that if you're doing science or even uh, trying to do experiments to gain knowledge. But like, do you need a theological underpinning for that? No, you just need the idea. And for a long time, people didn't trust that idea or they didn't have the method to do experiments very well. And so it wasn't used. I mean, I'm not saying I have a full answer to that. And I think it's a bit puzzling that particularly in the you know, sort of Greek philosophy and, and um, early scientific, uh, early study of nature, uh, that they didn't rely more on experiments. But the point is that you just don't need a theological underpinning for that. Now, it may be that you need a theological underpinning to motivate people to try doing that, but that's different from sort of as a justification, right? There's a difference between motivation and justification. And it's a little bit unclear which of these they're arguing for. It may be the case that early um, uh, scientists and, and sort of philosophers, a distinction, natural philosophers, a distinction didn't really exist then, uh, were, were partly motivated by an idea that God created an ordered universe. And we'll also see later this was true for some of these thinkers. Um, but it's different to say that and then to say that you need to have that as a justification for carrying out experiments or relying on experiments, which I just think is nonsense. You, you can just you know, you just have a hypothesis to, to, to and, and, and see if it works, right? And this is still what we do today, right? Some fields rely very um, heavily on experiments, others use them. Sometimes other fields don't really use experiments at all. So it, it sort of depends on the question you're asking in the field. And there's no sort of overarching question of this that sort of boils down to like, do I have a theology or, or something like that? It's, it's silly. Um, yeah, this is a very good point here. The word faith tends to be uh, in a sort of superposition of being in one sense in which is sort of the what you might call the philosophically sophisticated sense, which is just, well, it's just a sort of a confidence or a trust, which is based on evidence, but in the absence of like complete certainty. And that's fine. I don't really have a problem with that. But the thing is, first of all, that we, we have faith in things all the time. So it becomes a bit trivial, it seems, by that definition. And the other thing is that it seems to conflict with the theological use of the term, which is usually um, in a context of basically belief without evidence or with only minimal evidence. Um, and this is how th how Christians often use this, or uh, I assume uh, people in other faith traditions as well, but I'm mostly familiar with how Christians use it, right? They'll talk about, well, you just need to have faith. Well, when do they say that? You know, th they don't say that when you've got lots of evidence for something. They say that precisely when you don't have evidence or when it's not clear, you know, God's testing you, you need to have faith, right? That's how this term is used in ordinary discourse, right? Uh, and in a lot of theological discourse, I would say as well. So, yeah, I think that this is a real problem. And this will come up later when they talk about that as well. Um, so in, in the sense of sort of a trust or a confidence based on evidence, but extending beyond certainty. Sure, you need that to do science, but you need that to do pretty much anything in life. So it's it's that's what I mean. It's sort of trivial. Um, whereas if we take it in a sort of theologically enriched form, uh, whatever, however that might be understood, but more similar to common practice of how Christians use that term, then no, you don't need that at all for science. And in fact, I think that that is uh, not going to be helpful with scientific practice. But anyway, let, let's come back and we'll we'll hear what um, uh, D Dave has to say about this. And then I want to talk a bit more about uh, some of the key thinkers and figures in early 17th century, um, uh, the rise of science, because I want to delve into that a bit more detail than these guys do and explain to you why they're misrepresenting it. Well, I suppose, you know, the, the title that you put on the video was um, something like these physicists explain why science needs God. And I'm just worried that I don't want your audience to come away thinking, yeah, but they never explained why science needs God. So, you know, that, that is that's really what we're pushing at here, that, that science, the, what we what we kind of recognize now, what we want to call modern science is actually is resting on a whole lot of deep assumptions about the world that we live in. Like, and they're, they're fund those assumptions are fundamental. They're foundational. Without them, science would collapse. You, and the problem is that because we're sort of distanced from them a little bit, um, some people think they don't exist. It's a little bit like, you know, you're sitting in your house, 
and you can't see the foundations. And, and so you might forget that they exist, but they're definitely there. If they weren't there, your house would be falling down or it would have fallen down a long time ago. Um, and, and so science that is carried out now on a day-to-day -day basis where papers are published in peer-reviewed journals and, and all this sort of stuff is resting on um, some very fundamental beliefs about the world that we live in. And you, you've got to ask the question, well, what are those beliefs? And also, where did they come from, right? And uh, and so we, could, we can summarize them very quickly and then talk in more depth about any of the ones that you'd like. But um, first of all, you've got to believe that there is some sort of structure to the world, right? If you don't believe there's any kind of structure to the world, then your motivation to go and find structure literally doesn't exist, right? Um, so if you don't think that the world has got structure, if you don't think there's something underneath, you're not going to look for it. If you don't believe that there are laws of nature, you're not going to go and try and find any, okay? And, and this is actually what happens. There have been some cultures where the philosophical underpinning or the spiritual underpinning um, or the worldview of that culture is that um, the world is fundamentally chaotic and doesn't have any, um, it doesn't have any structure, right? It doesn't have any um, natural laws. You genuinely don't know what's going to happen next. And in those cultures, there was no development of anything that we would point out now and say, okay, that is, um, uh, you know, recognizable science. There were individuals who would take that sort of leap and then it would fizzle out again, right? Um, and I'll give you an example um, that can maybe help us get our head around it a little bit. Uh, in, in some polytheistic cultures in the past, so maybe look at somewhere like Egypt, you have a god of the Nile, you have a god of water, you have a god of um, palm trees or, or whatever, right? So you've got these different gods and, and they are ruling the universe, they're in charge of the universe. Um, but these gods, they're, they're really mostly like people in a lot of ways or super powered people. They, they cannot always be predicted, their behavior can't be predicted, they can be unreliable, they can fall out with each other, they can be in a bad mood and so on. Well, if in that sort of setting, there's no point in doing a science experiment, right? Um, you'd have to, if you wanted to find a boiling point of water, you'd have to have the god of conical flasks and the god of Bunsen burners and the god of water um, and the god of safety specs and the god of making sure your tie is tucked into your shirt um, so that you don't set it on fire. All those gods have got to be um, on board. They've all got to be interested. They've all got to be consistent. They've got to be in the right mood for you to get an experimental result. And then the next day, for you to get the same result, they've all got to be in the same mood. And, and I think we miss this. There's a, a fundamental assumption in, in modern science that says, yeah, but we'll get the same result on a Monday as a Tuesday. And we'll get the same result if we do the experiment in Chicago or whether we do it in um, Mombasa. Uh, but but those, those aren't obvious. It's not obvious that the laws that there are laws behind nature. And it's not obvious that they might be in different places at the same time. And it's not, it's not different that they might apply over a period of time. That's not obvious at all. The people who made those assumptions made those assumptions based on who they thought God was. They made it on the basis of... So I, I generally like to let them finish, but the, the, the nonsense is coming out so quick. And, uh, so what is it? Hard and fast? No, that's not what I want to say. Um, well, fast and furious. I, there's some expression that I've forgotten uh, th that I need to comment on before I forget what he said. So I remember one of the first things he said was that... Um, Without these particular assumptions, the ones that he's about to discuss, science would collapse. Now, I'm, it's really hard to understand what that statement means. So let's try to think about this. Let's take this idea of uniformity of nature and things like that, um, natural laws and so forth. Let's imagine that scientists just sort of forgot about them. That they just sort of that they just didn't make those assumptions, but but otherwise just kept doing whatever they were doing. Would science change? It's not clear that it would change at all, actually. <laughs> I mean, maybe it would change the way that they formed hypotheses, I suppose. Um, although even that's not entirely clear. But the point I'm making is that, like, I don't even know what it would mean for science to collapse. Like, science, like, they would just go into their labs and then, like, bump on, bump, <laughs> bump into the walls and, like, not know what to do. Like, <laughs> what exactly would change w with these underlying assumptions being, being different? The thing is that, I, I mean, I've, I'm sure... Um, what Dave here has, has studied a lot of science as well. I've studied different sciences for many, many years at university. Almost never do scientists or, or teachers in the you know that context talk about you know the uniformity of nature or natural laws. It basically only comes up if you're doing like history and philosophy of science, which itself is not science, or sometimes um, fundamental physics. It, it may be mentioned sometimes depending on the predilections of the of, of the lecturer and usually that happens if they sort of wax a bit philosophical about you know whatever they're whatever they're talking about you know god does not play with dice kind of kind of comment which itself is not really very scientific so the point is that i don't i don't actually buy this i don't think it really has much of anything to do with actual the actual practice of science now it may have had something to do with the origins of science which is which is different so we'll, we'll come back to that right but the idea that science would collapse if it if scientists didn't make these assumptions i don't think scientists mostly think about this at all um and, and in fact it's not even relevant for most scientists other than maybe for like you know theoretical physics uh which which is sort of the closest to um the fundamentals of reality if you like um or like the underlying laws of nature and even then i think most scientists have no interest or little interest in the philosophical underpinnings if there are any of, of uh, what they're doing 
Um, and that's why philosophy of science is, I don't want to say separable, but at least autonomous from scientific practice. Um, they're not the same thing. That, that's why you don't have to do philosophy to be a good scientist, um, uh, even though I think that the two can learn from each other, right? But that's not the same thing as saying that you have to do all these like theological courses. You have to do a lot of maths courses, like, like for example, to be a good theoretical physicist. You don't have to do a lot of philosophy courses. I mean, <laughs> and that would seem to be not what you'd expect if what Dave is saying here is correct, right? If you require all these assumptions and it would just collapse with that. So I just think that that's implausible and it's not, there's no reason to think that. But there's a now a separate question as to whether the origins of uh, of scientific practice and, and methods um, require these assumptions because because that's a little bit different. You can have sort of initial assumptions and then the discipline grow off that, um, and people can sort of not worry about those assumptions anymore and it become autonomous from. But that may have originated it, um, and so that's a question not so much of philosophy of science but of history of science. And that is, um, I think, what he's going to talk a bit more about here. And then uh, once he's done with that, I want to talk about how they're misrepresenting this believing in one God who was reliable and consistent and loved his people and created rationally. Um, and so uh, that, that's an example. Um, and to race through some others, we're made in his image and therefore our minds must be like little miniature versions of his mind. So we will be capable of understanding his world. Um, the four, Francis Bacon, Robert Boyle and others. Tom people in the chat are already raising some very good points here. Um, many of these I'm going to address in due course. There's lots of different sort of angles to respond to this. So yes, uh, but yeah, the good, um, yeah, there are some good thoughts here. I just, I, I don't want to want to acknowledge them, but also sort of move forward because I've got sort of a series of things I want to get through here. I've already said this. They believe that we somehow lost our relationship with nature and our understanding of nature in the fall, but that God had given us science as a gift to regain our knowledge of nature and, and produce a better and more positive relationship in the same way that he had given us the gift of charity to undo some of the other effects of the fall, like, um, you know, poverty and, and suffering. Uh, and they saw science as a natural partner to some of those other things um, to try and bring about reconciliation and undo um, the damage of the fall. Uh, and then there's also this idea that um, I mentioned earlier that God wants us to know him. And one of the things he's given us to know him is through studying the world. And all these things sit underneath modern science that we expect to be able to understand the world um, and, uh, and that we think there are laws and that we think we can find those laws and that we think those laws should apply everywhere and that we think they should apply at all times. And actually, you do the legwork, you find that those all came from within Judeo-Christian monotheistic thought. And most of the real significant progress um, was made by people who wrote with that as their major agenda. You know, uh, so when when an arch atheist like Jerry Coy in his busy studying way in his biology, what he's really doing is Christian science. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's where it really gets to the point of comedy where he says things like that. Uh, by the way, I'm probably, I mean, I'm an atheist, I'm a naturalist, so I, I guess I can as one of these arch atheists. Um, the phrase Christian science is ironic as well because that has its own meaning, which <laughs> has very little to do with what anything, uh, anything I think, uh, sorry, I keep forgetting his name, Dave Hutchins, Hutchings, wait, Hutchins? Hutch. Hutch Ings, yeah, Dave Hutch Ings is, is likely to be interested in it. But anyway, putting that to the side. So let, let's talk a bit about the origins of science here. Um, as I said, uh, sem the 17th century is the place to go um, to, to look at this. And I want to share a few things. Uh, I always get worried when I ch <laughs> change sharing on the uh, on live stream because I feel like I'm going to bugger it up. Um, all right, let's have a look at this to start with. Okay, so there's this, um, I guess you could call it a philosophical tradition or a perspective or an approach um, called the mechanical philosophy. And, and this is not really something that exists anymore because it's been subsumed into the approach of natural sciences, right? But this is effectively what um, what was developed in the 17th century as, um, I, I guess, the sort of, uh, me it's more like a, a combination of a metaphysical and a methodological approach to thinking about the natural world. Um and this was critical for the for the development of the scientific revolution. So, I mean, you can see some comments on this here. Um, the basic idea is that the universe as a whole could be thought of, or literally was, a giant machine, uh, which operated according to, you know, strict cause and effect, and on the basis of strict laws. Now, m many of the people who developed this did believe that it was well, probably all of them actually, because it was hard to be an atheist at the time, but. Most, if not all of them, did believe it was created, but the idea is that God just sets up the clockwork and then lets it run by itself. Now, some of them thought that he may, maybe could do miracles if he wanted to, but most of the time didn't. And I think, and then some of them, especially later on into the 18th century, were more deistic in in, in a disposition and, and thought that, no, God just sets it up and then lets the clock go because he gets it right the first time. He doesn't need to sort of tinker with it later on. Um, and um, so, but th the point is that this, this development here, uh, mechanical philosophy, contrasted with earlier ways of thinking about things in which um, 
well, they didn't necessarily think about God as, uh, sorry, uh, they didn't necessarily think about nature as sort of a clockwork. Um, they thought about it more as sort of being imbued by um, natural forces and um, impetus. So a, a good example of this would be Aristotelian metaphysics, which although is in some sense a closed system, it doesn't require God to keep injecting into it. Um, it's not a mechanical system because things have are uh, motivated by sort of these um, uh, tendencies or dispositions. Like, you know, the, there's the, there's the different elements and, um, objects that are, have a lot of earth in them, have a disposition or uh, sort of an, an impetus to move towards the center of the universe, which is why they fall down. Um, and, you know, um, planets and, and the, um, and the, the sun move around the earth because that's their disposition as sort of perfect heavenly objects. So, so this is not, I mean, in a sense, it was a, a regular description of nature, but it wasn't mechanical in quite the same way. And, and an important component of the mechanical philosophy was the idea of, um, <laughs> this word here, corpuscularianism. I think I got that about right, which is essentially, which is related to an, the, the idea of atomism, right? Basically that everything at the, the smallest level is made up of atoms or corpuscles, um, which sort of bump into each other and um, exert causal effects by, by hitting each other. And again, that's a very particular view that um, had been, or something like that had been defended by some Greek philosophers, but uh, was, was sort of controversial and was not what Aristotle thought. Um, but um, the point is that this idea of a mechanical philosophy, basically think of it as little billiard balls bumping into each other and as a as the result of a complicated set of interactions obeying a natural set of laws, um, the universe operated as a giant machine. Um, and so some of the early thinkers associated with this were Thomas Hobbes in the Leviathan, um, who wrote um, a lot about this idea. Uh, also, Rene Descartes, interestingly enough, even though he was a substance dualist, he thought that like pretty much the rest of the universe um, was basically a giant machine. He just thought that the immaterial mind uh, couldn't uh, be explained by that. And so he therefore um, th thought that there was some sort of substance beyond that. Um, Newton was also um, strongly influenced by this. I think it doesn't have a subheading here, but uh, where is he? Oh, Galileo was also, uh, Robert Boyle, that's the other one I wanted to mention. He was also one of the early uh, mechanical philosophers, um, and that influenced some of his work as well. So I want to share some more about that, um, looking at a few of the, oh, and there's an important one that I forgot to show as well. Francis Bacon was also active in this field. So so there's a sort of set of figures here, You're looking at Francis Bacon, Robert Boyle, uh, Thomas Hobbes, um, and uh, who was the other one? Oh yeah, Rene Descartes, and then... Um, a bit later, Newton, were some of the big figures here. And, and they were all kind of, uh, to varying degrees, buying, I mean, they had disagreements, of course, I'm simplifying here, but they were buying into this and, and, and expanding on this idea of this mechanical philosophy, the corpuscularian idea of nature. Um, and and this was a quite new and controversial at the time, um, but it really, um, I'm just hoping this will work if I change the URL, yes, it does work. It, it, it really um, contributed to their idea that you can actually understand the universe as a sort of a giant, uh, a giant mechanical system. Um, so this here is the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia article on Hobbes and philosophy of science. Uh, and again, there's a lot of interesting stuff here that, again, don't claim to be an expert or to, uh, um, uh, or to be comprehensive here, but I just want to talk about um, some of the points here. One of the things is that Hobbes was one of the first to argue for um, uh, a very particular um, view of the natural world as basically operating according to clockwork. And it was actually quite, I can't remember where it discusses this. It was actually quite controversial at the time because as it says here, um, his views were associated with atheism by many of his critics because basically there wasn't a place, it, well, there wasn't an obvious place in his view for God. Um, and they were, they were saying to him, well, you know, basically you're just saying the natural world just sort of operates like clockwork. What, what's God doing in this? And of course you could say, well, God created it, but but they were still a bit suspicious, right? And although I don't know if Hobbes actually was an atheist, uh, but at that time it wasn't acceptable to be an atheist, right? So if, that, if you're criticized as being that, then you had to be very careful. This same thing happened to Hume a hundred years later as well. Um, although his interests were a little bit different, but um, anyway, so he was very important here. Um, and I mean, it, I, I think it's interesting that some of this already we're seeing that the, the story is breaking down a bit, right? Because the idea is supposed to be that these are Christians coming up with these ideas. And although I don't know if Hobbes was nominally a Christian or really believed in some extent, but people were accusing him of being an atheism because of this particular view that was critical for the scientific revolution of the mechanical philosophy. Um, now, of course, others developed these views as well, but at least one of the key players was criticized for being an atheist precisely for defending these views. So I think that that is interesting. Um, but let's continue. Um, so what was it that I wanted to talk about? Here we go. 
It says here, most generally both Bo uh, Boyle and, and Hobbes, so Robert Boyle, we'll talk about him in a moment, viewed the natural world as composed of bits of matter in motion. Even if there were some points of agreement between the version of mechanical philosophy offered by Boyle and Humes, there are important differences. The crucial difference was the um, between the two relates to the status of the laws of nature. Boyle talked about laws of nature as established by God. Um, so that's, I'll show that in a moment. So that's what Boyle thought. Whereas Hobbes restricted discussion of laws to the laws of human conduct discovered by those who escape the state of nature and create a commonwealth. So, so that's that's his sort of political philosophy, which is a separate thing I don't want to get into here. But um, in terms of what he said about the natural world, um, he articulated a priori principles of motion at the foundation of his physics. Uh, rather than being known as laws of motion issued by some divine lawmaker, these Hobbesian principles of motion are explicated by thought experiments seem to rely upon a version of the principle of sufficient reason. Basically, everything that happens requires uh, some reason for happening, to put it very crudely. Although Hobbes held that they were all, they were true of all human experience, since Hobbes holds that we cannot know the actual causes of natural phenomena, uh, we would have to admit that nature might, unbeknownst to us, act otherwise. So we can't be sure about these things, right? However, despite the differences, the primary dissimilarity that emerged between Hobbes and Boyle concerning the air pump experiments, oh yeah, that's that's... Uh, I didn't want to talk about here. Um, and he's saying, and it goes on to talk about how Hobbes thought that although nature operated according to mechanical laws, it might be very difficult for us to know what those laws could be. Um, and uh, yeah, so as, as he's saying here, nothing can be demonstrated by physics without something also being demonstrated a priori. So, so he thought that you had to sort of rely on sort of first principles to get to a position of being able to develop explanations that you can then potentially test. Um, yeah, and he relied on geometry, or geometry a lot, which I think... It was a bit, yeah, I think he had some strange views about that, but I um, uh, don't want to go into that here. Um, there, there's plenty of other stuff as well. I just wanted to give you the general sense of how important he was and some of the criticisms that people raised of him. So let's now go to the article on Boyle. I, I'm just giving a flavor of some of the key players here and uh, sort of trying to explain how all this sort of fit together. So here's Robert Boyle. So he was... Um, more explicitly trying to argue that, as it says here, God is the author of the universe and free establisher of the laws of motion whose general concourse is necessary to the conservation and efficacy of every particular physical agent. I love the I love the old spelling. Um, interestingly, though, although it seems obvious to him, he doesn't really explain this, and this is not necessarily what everyone else thought, right? This is kind of a new idea that God establishes a clockwork and then kind of lets it run, uh, at least mostly lets it run. It's something to suppose that Boyle must uh, have had some reasonably well thought out views on the question of how God sustains the world. He was, after all, one of the most impa impatient, uh, impatient of thinkers when it came to fake or non-explanations, and was in danger. Uh, was in general very aware of the danger of letting verbal explanations get in the way of real ones. Yeah, I think that that's still an issue here. Okay, so this is the first mention of the scholastics. So scholasticism was basically the dominant philosophy in medieval Europe from, let's say, the 13th century to the 17th or 18th century. Um, and it was basically, again, gross oversimplification, but a, a combination of um, Christian theological viewpoints with uh, Aristotle's thought. Um, and th this had sort of really flourished from, yeah, maybe dating back to a little bit to the 12th, particularly the 13th century, um, and associated particularly with Thomas Aquinas. Um, and um, this was sort of the, the prevailing orthodoxy at this time. So the point to think about this is that Arist the um sorry, the, the scholastics were Christians as well, and they didn't develop the scientific method. In fact, the scholastic method was very different um, to the scientific method, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and the early proponents of the um, uh, of the, mecha the mechanistic philosophy or the mechanical philosophy um, were, were critics of, of uh, the scholastics in many ways, and, and we're seeing that here. Um, now, hang on, where did that come from? Sorry, I've lost my place. Uh, yeah, so Boyle here is saying... Um, to explicate a phenomenon being to deduce it from something else in nature more known to us than the thing to be explained by it, how can the employing of the incomprehensible substantial forms help us to explain intelligibility this or that particular phenomenon? So I think he's, he's talking about the idea of forms that Aristotle had, not, not platonic forms, but um, sort of universals that are imbued in the particulars that they um, that, that substantiate them. Um, yeah, and I wouldn't go through that. <laughs> it's hard to read the spelling. I, I keep getting confused. But yeah, the, the point here is he's critical of the existing orthodoxy, which of course was Christian as well. Boyle was a Christian, right? But he's coming from a different point of view. So this is not really like Christian, non-Christian. This is just a different way of thinking about nature and the relationship to God. Uh, what else does it say here? In theology is more likely to get elsewhere. Uh, yeah, so he's making his particular understanding of theology, objecting to the existing um, orthodoxy here. Um Ah, yes, I wanted to mention this as well. So he had a well worked doctrine concerning the limitations of reason and often points out that we should not expect fully to understand God's workings because he, after all, is a being of the most primary and singular nature. And this is a very important tradition throughout Christian thought, which goes back, well, 
pretty much to the beginning and is prevalent maybe in some strands of Christianity more than others. Um, basically, the idea is you can't even begin to fathom or understand God because he's so far above us. And that would include potentially his creation as well. Like, why would you think to understand the natural world? God is the supreme intellect and he created it. So it could be as arbitrarily complicated and, and mysterious as God is potentially, right? And, and, and this is where the theological ideas that um, uh, David Hutchings was just talking about uh, don't make any sense, right? Because there's many different theological approaches you can take to understanding God and his relationship to creation. You could say, well, God is ultimately other uh, and he created creation. So why would we expect to, be, we can't understand God because he's so other and, you know, far beyond, beyond us. So why would we expect to be able to understand nature? Um, on the other hand, you could say, well, no, God created the universe with a, a, you know, operating according to a clockwork set of rules and that those rules are rationally accessible to us as beings that, you know, uh, are created in the nature of God. But that's a very particular, basically 17th century understanding of the relationship between God and creation. And that's what people like Boyle um, and Descartes and others were arguing for. And that was in, contra in contrast to what the scholastics were arguing and what, you know, Christian traditions elsewhere were arguing. Um, so it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense here to say that it's it's Christianity necessarily. It's a very particular understanding. And as we've seen even from already by looking at um uh who was the one we looked at just before this? Um the guy who wrote Leviathan, names escapes here, the, the guy we just looked at, um, that that he was accused of being atheistic because there was too little role for God in his philosophy, right? So it's already we're seeing the gross oversimplifications here, but there's a bit more I want to talk about. Um, yeah, so so here Boyle is saying that, yeah, we've got to be careful because, you know, God's quite mysterious and we're not necessarily going to understand things fully, um, even even in law-like matters. How God could create the one, how it is that he can intervene in a matter as mysterious to us as how mind and body can interact, and that is a total mystery. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking, did I want to say anything else here? I think that's what I wanted to focus on there. So that was um, Robert Boyle. Let's have a look at Francis Bacon. So he was another big player here, again, all in the 17th century. Um, come on. Okay, very, oh, I guess, early, late uh, 16th, early 17th century here. Um, so very influential here, again, in natural philosophy um, and scientific methodology. And and it's sometimes said that he's the guy who, like, invented the scientific method, although obviously that's a simplification. But, um, yeah, so that's what this is saying here. Uh, the advancement of learning novum organum scientarium. Um now, what did I want to talk about here? Uh, wait, I've actually forgotten which part I wanted to I wanted to cover here. So um, that's why I like being able to. So he talks. Uh, I like to be able to highlight things, but you kind of can't hear. No, that's not what I wanted. I don't want his social philosophy. Um, okay, so let's look a bit about this. Um, so he talked. He talked a lot about induction. Um, ah, now this is important here. He repudiates the syllogistic method and defines his alternative procedure as one by which slow and faithful toil gathers information from things and begins to understand it. So that sort of sounds a lot like empirical science, right? Well, what's he mean by the syllogistic method? Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure what that's talking about is basically the approach that was used by the scholastics. What they tended to do is, um, yeah, sorry, Thomas Hobbes, that's the guy I was mentioned before. Um, it, it must be because I'm getting old. <laughs> it's just names escape my mind. Um, yeah, anyway, so... so um, so the method of the scholastics was basically to um, take a, a work that was by an established author, like a respected author, and then basically study it systematically, you know, like line by line, and, and try to understand the logical flow of it and then sort of reconstruct that. That's kind of what um, uh, Augustine, not Augustine, um, that's kind of what Thomas Aquinas did with, you know, with, with Aristotle and working all of that into a Christian framework or a lot of that into a Christian framework. Um and that's sort of an a priori method, right? You're sort of taking an existing set of, you know, beliefs or teachings and then trying to, like, logically work through that. Um, whereas he's repeating that. He's saying, no, 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 it, that's not how it works. You've got to sort of collect information um, and apply induction to that. Induction implies ascending to axioms as well as descending to works. Yeah, so there's sort of iterative between theory and then empirical practice and, and back and forth, which is kind of how the modern scientific method is works, right? So a lot of these ideas kind of go back to Francis Bacon here. Um, I don't know that there's too much else. Again, there's lots more that I'm not going to go through here and I'm not an expert. I'm <laughs> keep reemphasizing that, but I'm trying to give the sort of basic flavor of, of how, uh, basically how these guys were often reacting strongly against existing practices, especially scholasticism, uh, and developing a new way of thinking about, um, uh, of thinking about sort of nature and, um, uh, 
working that out in their particular way. So I'm just, how much does this has a mechanical philosophy here? It does mention this, but it's not a big part of this particular article. Okay, so he was another big figure here. Um, and again, although God it does feature there, it, it's not an obvious, like, Francis Bacon is not saying that this all derives from from God, right, in the sense that, that that's his axioms, right? He, he, he's talking about things in a much more applied way uh, and is even less concerned than Boyle, it seems, with trying to say that, you know, this is all um, coming out of God. Um, so, okay, I think that that's probably enough of those ones to give you the flavor of it. So we, we talked about some of the, the biggest, um, just to sort of summarize what we were talking about here, some of the major figures in the development of the mechanical philosophy. So we looked at the role of... Um, uh, Robert Boyle, of Francis Bacon, of um, uh, of uh, oh, I'm getting old here. We talked about Rob Boyle, talked about Francis Bacon. We talked about um, Hobbes, and I also mentioned Galileo and um, a bit who comes a bit later, um, Isaac Newton. Um, all of whom were quite influential here and sort of applied different results in in different contexts, and of course had disagreements with each other. But the long and the short of it is, this is a very particular approach to natural philosophy that emerged really in the 17th century in reaction to or responding to scholasticism. It was quite controversial at the time. I don't see how you can in, in any particular way say that this is deriving from Christian theology because it's like, yeah, obviously it emerged in a Christian context and many of these people did react with, interact with theology, but it's a particular approach to it, which is like novel and, and didn't exist before. Um, and, and also some, like Hobbes, for example, were criticized for being too atheistic precisely because they seem to remove the, the uh, place for God in, in their picture. So this is this is sort of what I wanted to explain when I'm uh, what I'm this is what I mean when I was saying that they um, that um, I was in this interview, particularly Dave Hutchings are uh, misrepresenting the his the, uh, the historical um, development of, of these sorts of ideas because they. As, are talking as if it's like, oh, well, people just thought about the idea of natural law coming from God, and then they developed science from that. But that just wasn't how it worked. Um, now, what else did I want to say at this point? Yeah, there's more things to come. Um, I think we'll go back to the video now, and then we'll see where that takes us. Oh, okay, so I've got to reshare that. Um, yeah, I seem to be much better at remembering the names of ideas than the names of people. I'm not sure. If that's a particular condition or whatever, but all right. Let me know if the audio is working. I think I clicked that button. Uh, so on that note, on the Christian note, uh, one of the things that I really liked about the book in chapter four is you point out that Christianity in particular sort of elevates wisdom and calls us to submit our theories to the evidence. And then the biggest example that you give of this is the Apostle Paul and his theory before he had his Damascus Road experience was that Jesus has created this sort of repulsive cult and uh, and that all changed when he came in contact with some new evidence. And so he updated his beliefs based on the evidence. And uh, so here's one way that I think an atheist might come back on that though, is they might say uh, the Bible commands Christians to have faith and that faith is believing without seeing. Even when Jesus was talking to Thomas, he was like, no, you don't need to see me. You know, you're just supposed to believe. So what is your response to that kind of response about the, the whole Christian story playing a role here in science? Well, one thing I would, I'd, I'd start, and I'm sure Dave has plenty to say here, um, that's a classic example of cherry-picking texts, and we've heard that a, 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 a huge number of, number of times. Um, Jesus didn't criticize Thomas. Jesus um, uh, actually praised him uh, for I don't, being the first disciple to, to turn to Jesus and say, my Lord and my God. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, Thomas is um, the patron saint of many things, but scientists is, is one, 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 one of them. Um, yes, indeed, it's true that Jesus said that those who believed and hadn't had the opportunities that Thomas had were also also blessed, but that doesn't mean he condemned what Thomas did um, in terms of asking for evidence. On the contrary, Christ opened his side and gave him that very evidence. Um, and since then, there's been a long tradition of, of um, you see, uh, again, the word faith, pistis in New Testament Greek, is, is has been completely twisted out of its New Testament meaning in our, in our, our times. And um, I'm, you know, so... Uh, how many, you know, pop atheist podcasts have you do, have you heard faith defined as believing in things without evidence? Well, it's not. New Testament Christianity is not believing in things without. How do you think the average Christian would define faith, or maybe how it's used in the average sermon or inspirational Christian video or or whatever? Um, this guy seems to have a big in his bonnet about popular atheist authors, and to be fair, <laughs> there's a lot of nonsense from those. Um, but I don't think that you can really blame atheist popularizers for presenting faith in a particular way. That was what I was discussing before, because the way Christians typically use it seems to be more or less in, in the way that he's saying is wrong. 
Do you think the average Christian cares about what the Greek word for it was or, you know, a particular theological conception of it? I, I, they don't care about things like that. It's not, it's not interesting to most most Christians, right? It's about how they use it and interact with their understanding of their relationship with God and so forth. So, I mean, this they, they do mention this a little bit later, but if, you know, if, if he thinks that that's wrong, then he should criticize Christians for it just as much as the atheists. Um, now, let's talk about Thomas here. So I wanted to read the passage where this comes up because I actually think this is an important example of the notion of faith here um yeah i mean this is this is a good question if if the evidence is so important why does it not everyone have this evidence so let, let me read that passage which is found in john 20 verses uh 24 to 29 now thomas one of the 12 was not with the disciples when jesus came so the other disciples told him we have seen the lord but he thomas said to them unless i see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side i will not believe so that actually seems a fairly sensible attitude, right? That's a good skeptical attitude. Um, so let's see how the story presents that. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He then said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet have believed. Okay, so we see there that, yeah, Jesus does give Thomas the evidence and then he believes. Um, but what does Jesus say to Thomas after that? He says, well, he says, stop doubting and believe. Now, their doubt is used as the antonym of believe, right? So belief is good, doubt is bad. Um, then later on, you know, Thomas accepts Jesus and he says, you know, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus says to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. So that's just a statement of fact, right? And then he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So who is blessed here? Is it Thomas or is it the people who have seen but not believed? Uh, sorry, who have not believed but believed but seen. Got it the wrong way around. Uh, um, Jesus doesn't say, blessed are you, Thomas. Uh, he just says, well, you saw me, so you believe. That's good. But th blessed are those who didn't see but still believe. So it seems to me that what matters here is whether you believe or not. It doesn't matter whether you have good evidence for the belief. Um, you should just believe, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe there's more to it than that, than this little story. But but it seems to be, I mean, you could ask the theological purpose of this story. Um, I know that early, well, some of the earliest um criticisms we have against Christianity, they're a little bit after the time John was written, but they're basically, um, you know, Roman uh, and, and Greek writers saying Christianity is foolish and superstitious. And we're like, we can't understand why people believe these ridiculous things. Um, and so it, it's almost, I mean, I, I'm not saying this is necessarily the origin of this, but it's almost like that this is inserted as a way of saying, well, yeah, okay. So there's some weird stuff here, you know, people coming back from the dead and so forth, but you know, you just have to have faith. You just have to believe, right? Um, and there's nowhere in the story where it's apparent that it's good to be skeptical or it's good to doubt or it's good to require evidence. <laughs> okay, so let's imagine a different version of the gospel, right? Instead of saying, uh, it's, let's imagine the Doubting Thomas story works differently. Like this is Doubting Thomas um, 2.0. Okay, so Jesus comes along and he says, uh, and he says, blessed are, you, blessed are you, Thomas, for doubting. Because unlike the rest of my disciples who just believe based on stories, you required evidence. So here's the evidence. And I say unto you, blessed are those who seek evidence and only after sufficient evidence, then believe. Now imagine if it said that, right? That <laughs> that would be a very different um, presentation of the story and, and potentially have a, a, a different, you know, have a very significant effect on, on the way, you know, Christian faith was understood and, and theology developed. Um, I'm not a theologian, so I, I can't speak to that precisely, but you, you see how that would be a very different story, right? Uh, which story seems to fit more uh, with what um, uh, with what Tom here is saying about the nature of faith? It seems to me um, that if what he was saying was true, then you should have the, the Downing Thomas 2.0 story or something like it appearing, not the actual Downing Thomas story, where there's, again, doubt is bad, belief is what matters, people are blessed when they believe without seeing, and there's no indication that it's good to require evidence or be skeptical. So I... I you know, I think that this story, it really does illustrate how our faith is typically seen and deployed in Christian discourse. And I, I don't think it's unreasonable that that it has that effect because the straightforward reading of the story seems to um, seems to substantiate that point. Uh, this is a very good point. We will get to that. As I've been saying, chat's been making some really good points. I can't talk about everything at once, but we will get to that because they talk more about that later. All right, let's move on. Oh, bugger. <laughs> 
I pressed the wrong button. All right. I press stop instead of what I wanted to press. Let's try that again. That's what I wanted to press. It is belonging to a story. It is choosing to identify yourselves with God's people in following him. And that can be largely evidence-based. By the way, science itself, <laughs> in, you know, in, in what we said before, it pulls ex examples, it, that example of changing your mind in the face of evidence is exactly one beautiful example of what Dave and I meant before when we were talking about everyone being a little bit a scientist. If, if anyone changes their mind in the face of evidence, then, um, then they're being a little bit a scientist. And Paul was too. Uh, when um, uh, I really don't like that because science is not the same as inquiry. I mean, look, there's a there's a broader point here in which you could say, is there actually a demarcation between science and non-science? And I'm actually a bit skeptical of that. Um, but at least the way that the concept's usually deployed, science is just not the same as like any type of responsiveness to evidence. That's why like law and history and logic uh, and, and the humanities are distinct disciplines, right? Or, and philosophy uh, from, from science. So, so you can't just say that just because you change your mind or responsive to evidence, you're like being a scientist. I mean, I, I sort of get the point they're trying to make here. And so like, I half agree with the, the general idea there, but um, I, I just think that, again, there's this, there's this challenge here between if you want to say that science needs God, what is science? Um, do you take a narrower notion, which is that science is a particular approach to understanding and, and studying the natural world, which emerged in 17th century Europe? Or is it a broader sense in which just like any approach to studying the natural world? Um, if it's the narrow approach, if you're defining it narrowly, then the comment he, he said here doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because like just responding to evidence is not distinctive to science. But if you're taking the broader notion of science, and I think most of the other things that he said uh, just, just don't fit with this idea that science needs God at all. And we'll, we'll, keep, we'll see that more as they go forward. But just keep that in mind, like how is science being defined or deployed in a particular usage of it? Because there's, there's a big problem here with using a broad notion when it's convenient and then using a narrow notion when it's convenient. We saw he did that early on, like when people said, well, why did science emerge in the 17th century if it requires God? And they said, oh, no, no, it didn't emerge in the 17th century. It's been, you know, it goes back much further than that. But then when they want to say, oh, actually, it it, it emerged because people believed in God, they say, oh, well, you know, look at uh, people like Descartes and, and Robert Boyle, that they both believed in God and that he had natural laws, right? But that's taking the narrow view of science, right? If science is older than that, then what difference does it make what they believed? So I, I want you to keep thinking about that. What, what a conception of science are they using in any particular example? When you actually do do science, and this I can speak to because I've been trying to do it for a long wee while, um, the role of, of what you might call faith or, in other words, deciding to align yourself with a particular story and then see if that makes sense of the world in which you live is precisely in the small Fact. sense, perhaps with a small f on the word faith, scientists do all the time. I remember when um, I first got interested in a model for the, the long chain molecules we were talking about before um, that help us understand jello and jelly and sorts of plastics that are polymers that are made into uh, plastics. There was back in the 1980s when I started this, a really encouraging looking uh, theory, a model which we call the tube model. Um, other experimental data, it got completely wrong. So we'll skip this, and do my we skipped that earlier part of it. Be. Now, <laughs> the way I've talked, that, talked about that, <laughs> if it sounds, if it's meant to sound a little bit like the way people discuss how they, you know, it, because it's very, very similar. So Dave, uh, we're actually, yeah, I'm sure he's got a lot to say on this uh, this as well, but I just wanted to let the audience know we are about to do some Q&A with both Tom yeah. and Dave here. So if you have a question for either of them, leave it in the leave it in the live chat. If you send it as a super chat, that's the easiest way for me to find it, get it on the screen. And it's also the best way to make sure that your question is uh, asked and answered today. So yeah, Dave, anything that you'd like to add to sort of summarize the things that you've said so far and then anything on what, what um, well, I think it's on that last, uh, that last comment. Um, I do think Christians have to take their fair share of the blame here. You know, we can we can vilify atheist podcast hosts if we want, but um. But there are Christians who readily say um, that they are, they believe, um, you know, they don't care about evidence. And they're real Christians, you know, but they're just, they're getting it wrong. They, they, their approach is wrong. Um, and and some people almost do it with a kind of pride, but they're like, well, I don't need any of that stuff to tell me to, that I know my God is real or whatever. Um, and, and people who speak like that are out of step with the Bible's language. Um, the Bible uh, talks us to, you know, it talks about seeking wisdom. It says wisdom is more precious than rubies, um, that we should be, we should be after this sort of stuff. And I'll tell you a story. I am. Um, when I first went to university, I had grown up going to a pretty small church, um, with not very many people my age. Uh, I, when I ended up at university, I had a pretty dead set idea of my Christianity and what Christianity was. And then I bumped, I bumped into a whole lot of other people in the Christian Union who had some different ideas to me. And at first I was like, oh, God, OK, you've sent me here to, to be a blessing to all of these heretics and get them straightened out on all of their theology. But of course, over time, I began to realize that there was stuff that I was wrong about and that I needed to change my mind on. And I I got a very limited perspective on or I was missing some information. And um a very important aspect of maturity. And he's making some good points here. And this is actually quite a telling story. That's why I want to share it here. And so I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll start going to a bunch of different churches and hearing some different ideas and so on. Now, one of the ones I ended up going to met in a barn, a converted barn. In fact, it hadn't been converted that much. I'm pretty sure there was still like some hay around. 
Um, and that perhaps should have been the first warning that something was a bit odd about this particular church. And then there was a guy playing the accordion up the front. Again, that should probably be a bit of warning sign. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, this meeting was kind of a little bit crazy. It was kind of like if there had been chandeliers, people would have been swinging off them and people were shouting out and rolling around and all this kind of stuff. And I just thought, this is nuts. And then the minister said, um, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit and you want to you want more of God, then come to the front. And I thought, well, I do want to know God more. Um, I'm, I'm open to, you know, whatever the Holy Spirit might want to give me. So, uh, so I went up to the front and the guy put his hand on my back and he said, I'm going to pray for you to receive the gift of tongues. And he started praying for me. And then he pushed me. Um, and not very much happened because he was about five foot two. Uh, and then he and then he said, right, start speaking in tongues. And, uh, and I couldn't. And then he said, oh, well, it's, it's not working. It's not working. Um, and I said, yeah, well, I've noticed that myself. Thank you. And then he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a I'm a student. He said, what are you studying? And I said, I'm studying physics. And he said, ah, that'll be the problem. OK. And so there, there is a church leader telling a young Christian that the reason that the Holy Spirit will not work in that person's life is that they are studying physics. Don't worry, though. There's no conflict between science and religion, guys. It's all <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> right. And um, and this uh, this happens. It's not it's not just the Lawrence Krauses of the world who are saying God or science, pick a side. There are Christians saying that. And what they need is a total re-education about the history of all this. That actually um, science is, is completely... Not now, if only he just stopped there, because at the moment I'm like, yes, excellent, yes. <laughs> L let's fight back against these silly views about, you know, where you, <laughs> like, so somehow studying physics means, well, I mean, speaking tongues is kind of dodgy in itself, but, like, it, it, it doesn't obviously mean you, you can't be a Christian or you can't, you know, have faith or whatever. It's really a separate area. But... Uh, and, and these regressive views about science and so forth. Um, but why can't he just stop there, right? He has to include this part where it's going to go, no, no, So we'll see how that goes. Not just in keeping with Christianity, but it was driven by Christianity. It's undergirded by Christianity. Um, and it's given its motivation by, by Christianity. Uh, so it needs, the whole thing needs to be flipped on its head. And, and when you have things like um, anti-vax movements and climate change, denial and all this kind of stuff, it's amazing how often it seems to be jumped on by Christians. And, and I don't think it's anything to do with... Um, you know, vaccinations themselves or climate change themselves, there's this sort of enmity that, that people are putting in place that doesn't need to be there. And if they knew their, their history, um, it wouldn't be there. So that's one of the things that Tom and I want to do with, with the book, Let There Be Science, is about reconciliation. And it's not just about trying to um, get some hard-nosed atheist to go, oh, wow, I haven't realised that there are all these Christian assumptions. This is a sort of an ongoing point that I like to talk about. I also talk about with Nathan on our bad apologetics videos, how, how these sort of people like apologists and popularizers talk about atheists. The, the term hard nosed is often used um, or uh, like radical skeptics is sometimes used. Radical atheists, I guess, is used sometimes as well. Um, uh, th there's other terms as well, but um, it, it's just it's an interesting sort of uh, sort of discourse there about how how the it's way the othering i think about setting up as atheists it's not just like people who believe different things but it's like very different like you know they're hard nosed you know they're radical you know closed minded you know sort sort of sort of people um which of course can be true sometimes but then like, that could be true for any any world view i just think that that's interesting that 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 comes up a lot like i, I don't know why that there's often this this need to sort of provide adjectives before saying atheist or maybe naturalist as well um again i mean you know atheists do that christian as well I, I just don't think like unless you're being specific about the type of like you're making a specific claim about a specific type of people but to just sort of throw in these adjectives as a way of coloring what you're saying i, I just i think it's sort of disingenuous and contributes to a poor quality dialogue but anyway that's that's a that's a side point in science um which of course we do want them to do and um it's also about getting the christian community to say will you please stop pushing against science if it's some sort of enemy because it isn't an enemy it's a gift from god like um like music is and so on Tom, is there anything you'd like to add before we to oh, brother, move brother, to some no, Q&A? Just absolutely, absolutely how, how, um, uh, how, uh, how it is. And this is why I've been, been talking about not only is science as a gift, it's a gift that fits perfectly into purposes for human beings created in his image um, within his created world. Uh, loving and caring his world and creating new parts to it just, just, just as he does. Um, it's appropriate we use science for healing. It's appropriate we use science for exploration and, and, and knowledge. So um, not only has the hist history of science been um, supported, and it is now supported by, 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 by Christian faith, its very purpose and direction is in service of God too. Um, and uh, it, it does break my heart, I have to say, when Christians let God down um, by setting up uh, science as if it were in opposition to the gospel because you hear that christians when you set up science as if it's in opposition to the gospel so based on what he said here and slightly afterwards that is going to include denying global warming denying vaccination or efficacy of vaccinations denying um uh, evolution then you're letting god down so let's not have any more of that <laughs>
So I'm, I'm with him on that part. Let's let's stop denying science, right? This is <laughs> it's not not intellectually defensible, and it, yeah, it's it's not it's not a way to promote intellectual virtues by going down those hole, those holes anyway. So I'm agreement. Well, I'm in agreement with that the, point. Not from the case. So let me do what I was going to do and tell you guys about a, a conference that we have coming up. Yeah, this so is this advertising. Is so let's skip this. Being God's so just some fun and support these types of conferences where people reference it, which is just an Christianity initiative. This is. Oh, support well, the Patreon, Patreon as well. All right, Patreon. I yep. lost okay. the question, the other questions that were sent in. Fortunately, I do have the super chat, so let me go ahead and actually pull that one on the screen. So this one is from Maverick Christian. He says, "Yay, I'm looking forward to att to attend an apologetics thingy where I can bring my camera. I haven't done that in four years. Remember, Cameron? So you guys don't know this, but uh, Maverick, a scientist. I don't have the other co the question asked. The question. Actually, I think honestly, atheists might still be here. So if you have your question, but I try to remember what it was because I, I explained Tom and Dave. How do you explain these other non-Christian or you could even say atheist or secular civilizations who are nevertheless able to produce, you know, better technology. And I would take it a step further. How do you explain somewhere like Norway, where it's mostly atheistic or it's mostly secular? How are they thriving? You know, it seems like science is still possible in these secularized places. So how do you respond to that? Okay. So this is a point that people have raised in chat is that, um, well, you know, <laughs> different civilizations other than, than, uh, Christianity have also done science, at least if we understand it in the broad term. Again, there's the broad and the narrow sense, like science as sort of practiced in the modern world. That was developed um, in Europe, uh, which at the time was Christian. Um, but that doesn't mean that a lot of good work to study the natural world, which is broadly part of science, was not done by other civilizations. So, like, how do we understand that? So let's see what they have to say about this. Well, it's, it's still sitting on the Christian foundations. That's a, the point that we're making is um, you can be an atheist and be a scientist, but you're using Christian theology to support what you're doing. You're just not aware of it. Um, so, uh, so, so I said before, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. If, you, <laughs> if you're not aware of it, then why do you need it? it it's, it's really strange. Like, how, how can it be necessary for doing it if you can do it without even knowing that you that you need it or knowing anything about it? What purpose does it serve? It doesn't seem to add anything. I, I, she just was, it seems to be a contradiction in terms. It's like it, it makes no difference, but it makes all the difference in the world at the same time. Like without it, remember he said science would collapse without it, he said before. It just, uh, what is it supposed to be doing? This is especially important if we if we think about the different philosophies of science, basically between the, the, the debate between realism and instrumentalism. So realism is a view which says broadly that science or at least well-established to confirm scientific theories, tell us about how the world really is in some sense. Whereas instrumentalism says scientific or like established scientific results are useful. They serve, they serve predictive roles. They can serve descriptive roles. They can serve value in technology and so forth. But they don't necessarily, or at least we can't know whether they tell us anything about the way the world really is. Um, uh, so I, I don't really want to get into that debate here. The reason I mention it is because, especially if you're an instrumentalist about science, why do you need to believe anything about the way the world is, you know, underpinning that? It's just like, well, it's useful for these purposes. I don't have to believe anything about the uniformity of nature or even that there are such things as laws of nature. All I have to say is that what I'm doing has useful purposes for description, for prediction, for technology, for whatever, you know, how you'd find useful. Um, that's all you need, right? Now, if you're a realist, you want to go a bit beyond that. You want to say we're actually learning about sort of the, the, the underlying structure of reality, so to speak. So maybe there's some more assumptions there. But Certainly, I mean, and I don't think his point works even under that, but I'm just emphasizing that, especially under instrumentalism, what he's saying makes no sense at all, because there's literally no place, if you're an instrumentalist, for anything beyond, like, just the descriptive and predictive successes of, of what you're doing. Uh, and so, it just, I, I don't understand how he can keep saying that they're, that scientists are relying on or, or using or dependent on <laughs> these, these Christian, you know, theological assumptions without being able to say what difference they make to anything and also it seems claiming that they make literally no difference like imagine if someone at your work said actually in everything that you do you're dependent on this belief or this assumption but then they also said well but if you didn't have that but you don't even know it right and if you didn't have that assumption you just keep doing everything that you're doing exactly the same way well maybe then you're not actually dependent on it maybe then it actually doesn't matter in the slightest i just i don't i don't understand the argument at all i nearly stopped sharing again so, so let me give you um, I mean, that would cover the modern example right, uh, of Norway. Um, let me give you an example. Yes, yeah, so now let's look at For those of you who want a bit of a reading during a lockdown. Um, so uh, now this is interesting. I, I can't be bothered looking up this paper. It sounds really stupid. Um, but let's hear what he has to say about it. Yeah, there we go. Uh, a language, culture, origin, understanding of science in Japan. Right. So let me, this is written by a couple of Japanese um, uh, analyzers. And they say, um, Japanese prospective science teachers conform to the Japanese traditional way of thinking 
which has never laid a primary emphasis either on immutability or universality. Now, immutability and universality is this like, you know, related to this idea that there are just certain fundamental laws about how nature works, right? Now, that has to be in place. There has to, it has to be in place that there are fundamental laws about how nature works if you're going to do proper science, okay? Um, and, uh, and so here we've got a paper, a fairly recent paper, saying, well, that doesn't exist in, in the traditional Japanese way of, of thinking. And they, they did a, a very interesting experiment, right? Now, we've just shown how that doesn't exist in the traditional European way of thinking either. And I, I want to read another quote about that. So this this is a book that I have here, which is quite a good one. I haven't read too much of it. I've looked a bit through it just for this one. Hang on. This is not working well. Let's let's just actually do this. No, <laughs> that's the opposite of what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay. Uh, so Science and Religion, a Historical Introduction, by uh, edited by Gary uh, Ferngren. Ferngren. Um, and it's a series of essays about different like periods in, in history and different uh, issues in the relationship between history and philosophy of science. Very good book. I wanted to re read a brief passage here, which is again talking about the scientific revolution and the uh, and the idea of mechanical philosophy in particular. Um, so it's a bit of a longer passage, but hopefully it will. Like I want what I want to do is contrast what these guys are saying with what the actual you know scholars are saying. We've already looked at that a bit with the Stanford Encyclopedia. Um, I just want to emphasize this a bit as well. So let's see. Well, actually, I, I might even go some into the background because they're about to talk about the idea that. It's only in a Christian worldview that you you get this idea of laws of nature, and that's just that's just rubbish, right? So you'll see what I mean here. Okay, I'm reading from page 144 for those of you following along at home. Um, uh, no, I've changed my mind. I'm going to read from page 143, the start of the chapter. Mechanical philosophy was a philosophy of nature, popular in the 17th century, that sought to explain all natural phenomena in terms of matter and motion without recourse to any kind of action at a distance. During the 16th and 17th centuries, many natural philosophers rejected Aristotelianism which had provided metaphysical and epistemological foundations for both science and theology, at least since the 13th century. So that's what I mentioned before. That was a rediscovery of Aristotle. That was Thomas Aquinas and so forth. One candidate for a replacement was the mechanical philosophy, which had its roots in classical Epicureanism. Mechanical philosophers attempted to explain all natural phenomena in terms of the configurations, motions, and collisions of small, unobservable particles of matter. So that's corpuscularianism. For example, to attempt to explain the fact that the lead is denser than water, a mechanical philosopher would say that the lead has more particles of matter per cubic measure than water. The mechanical explanation differed from Aristotelian explanations, which endowed matter with real qualities and used them to explain the differences in density by appealing to the fact that lead has more absolute heaviness than water. That's what I was saying before uh, as the difference between what they're saying and what Aristotelianism was saying, which was the, the standard way of thinking at the time. A hallmark of the mechanical philosophy is the doctrine of primary and secondary qualities, according to which matter is really endowed with only a few primary qualities and all others are the result of the impact of primary qualities in our sense organs. Nature was thus mechanized, and most qualities were considered subjective. So those would be like color, taste, and uh odor and so forth, their secondary qualities. This approach enhanced the mathematization of nature at the same time that it provided an answer to the skeptical critique of sensory knowledge. So these are two very important uh, ideas that there was a very skeptical attitude towards sensory knowledge because it's like, well, what does sensory knowledge have to do with the way the world really is? Because our senses sort of distort and the world's complicated. And also the idea of mathematization. Well, mathematization becomes easier if you think that there's a f sort of set of, of primary properties that you can describe quantitatively and that are sort of underpinning everything there. While the mechanical philosophy was attractive to thinkers working in the tradition of Galileo Galilei and uh, William Harvey, it posed serious problems for those holding a Christian worldview. Uh oh. Wait, let's read that again. While the mechanical philosophy was attractive to thinkers working in the tradition of Galileo Galilei and William Harvey, it posed serious problems for those holding a Christian worldview. So this philosophy, which was critical to the development of modern science, and true, it was held by Christians as well, but at the time it was seen to hold big problems for those advocating a Christian worldview. Well, let, let's let's read on a bit. Orthodox natural philosophers feared that the mechanical philosophy would lead to materialism or deism, resulting in the denial of creation and divine providence. We, we already heard that this was what Thomas Hobbes was criticized for. The fact that the Thomas synthesis of theology and Aristotelian philosophy became uh, dominant in the Catholic world, especially after the Council of Trent in the mid 16th century, also meant that the rejection of Aristotelianism seemed to challenge the doctrine of transubstantiation. Skipping a little bit there about that. Christian mechanical philosophers adopted a variety of strategies to stave off these perceived threats, including frequent appeal to the argument from design as a way of establishing God's providential relationship to the world he created, special attention to proving the existence of the immaterial, immortal human soul, and attempts to explain the real presence in the Eucharist in mechanical terms. Okay, so that last part there is, I mean, I don't, I don't know about that, but <laughs> that's not something that we, we consider today as being important. So you, you see the point here is that a mechanical philosophy poses a threat to God because there seems that there's just not as much for God to do 
And they said, well, God creates the whole thing, but that's why they then focused on arguments for design because they really needed to show that God needed to set the whole thing up. Because if that, if, if the whole thing works without God and God didn't even set it up, then there's a problem there. Right. Um, and they also thought that there was something special about like the human soul or the mind. And they wanted to place that as sort of apart from, or, or separate from nature. And this was, this is especially prominent in the thought of Rene Descartes, who was otherwise sort of into the whole mechanical philosophy thing. Okay. Continuing on a bit. I'm not going to read the whole book or anything, but I think that these passages is really good and show the how how badly these guys are misrepresenting uh, the situation. The mechanical philosophy originated in classical times with the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who sought to explain all natural phenomena in terms of the chance collisions of material atoms in empty space. He even claimed that the human soul is material, composed of atoms that ex that are exceedingly small and swift. Epicurus believed that atoms have always existed and that they are infinite in number. Epicureanism, while not strictly atheistic, denied that the gods play a role in the natural or human worlds, thus ruling out any kind of providential explanation. Uh, sounds like he had some things going for him, Epicurus. Because of its reputation as atheistic and materialistic, Epicureanism fell into disrepute during the Middle Ages. And here we see another ex example of anything that gets attached to the label of atheism uh, is, is discriminated against and viewed as suspect. The same thing happened with Hume uh, even later in the 18th century. Uh, but where are we? I'm on page 145 at the moment. The writings of Epicurus and his Roman disciple Lucretius were published during the Renaissance, along with a host of other classical writings. So this was one of the important things that happened in the Renaissance, that some of these classical writings began to be rediscovered, brought over from either the Arab world or from from, from the Greek world, like the, the um, uh, Byzantine Empire, uh, and, and they began to influence, uh, to influence the thinkers, particularly talking in sort of the 15th, 16th, and then into the 17th century. Following the development of heliocentric sorry, heliocentric astronomy in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, many natural philosophers believed that Aristotelianism, which rested on geometric assumptions, could no longer provide adequate foundations for natural philosophy. So again, Aristotelianism underpins the sort of neo-Aristotelian synthesis that had been that it was, was the predominant philosophy in the Christian West since the since the 13th century. So it was being undermined by these sorts of uh, findings and assumptions. Among the many ancient philosophers that had been recovered by Renaissance humanists, the atomism of Epicurus seemed particularly compatible with the spirit of the new astronomy and physics. Moreover, the mechanical philosophy often seemed easier to reconcile with Christian theology and the alternatives, Stoicism, Neoplatonism, and Paracel Paracelsianism. Never even heard of that one. I've heard of Paracelsus, but never heard of it in that term there. All of which appear to limit the scope or freedom of God's action in the world. So you see that they're trying to find... Um, new ways of thinking about the relationship between God and nature to sort of reconcile these problems and, and um, new findings and developments, like particularly from Galileo, uh, from Galileo and later from Newton. Early advocates of the mechanical philosophy included David von uh, Van Gorley, Sebastian Basso, and various members of the Northumberland Circle, of which Walter Warner and Thomas Harriot and Nicholas Hill were members. I've not really heard of any of those. Again, don't claim to be an expert here, but there's, you know, you see there's quite a few early thinkers here. Um, Although each of these men favored some version of atomism, none of them developed a systematic philosophy or addressed the theological problems associated with atomism. So uh, that's interesting there because it's saying a lot of them were talking about this without necessarily specifically making that theological connection or dealing with these theological problems. I mean, I, I assume that they were still most of them Christians because you kind of had to be at this point. But anyway, um, for those who don't know, I'm reading some passages from this book here to illustrate um, some of the problems with and uh, how, how the um, gentlemen in this video of Cameron's are misrepresenting the history and philosophy of science but i mean the streams are designed to watch from the start so um hopefully you can kind of get the idea but if not maybe jump back to the beginning okay uh where are we i'll skip a little bit here it does mention rene descartes being influential there's a little bit more i want to read and then we'll get back to get back to the video uh, a number of the major figures whose names are associated with the scientific revolution adopted some form of the mechanical philosophy so that's what i was saying before this idea of the mechanical philosophy is extremely important for the development of early modern science not the only thing going on right there's experimental developments like the telescope for example with galileo but that's an important factor there uh but, but, but although galileo did not write a fully articulated account of it uh he implicitly adopted its major tenets uh, skipping a little bit, Gassendi and Descartes published the first systematic and most, systematic and most influential accounts of the mechanical philosophy. Uh, their treatises are not detailed accounts of particular subjects, rather they spell out the fundamental terms of mechanical philosophy and function as programmatic statements describing what such philosophy would look like in practice. Uh, while both men agreed that all physical phenomena should be explained in terms of matter and motion, they differed about the details of these explanations. Uh... Yeah, I'll keep reading here. So Gassendi, writing in the, in the manner of a res renaissance humanist, saw himself as the restorer of the philosophy of Epicurus. Uh, 
deeply concerned about Epicurus's heterodox, heterodox ideas. Basically, he's not a Christian, so that's got to be bad. Uh, Gassendi, a Catholic priest, sought to modify ancient atomism so that it would be acceptable to 17th century Christians. Accordingly, he insisted on God's creation a finite number of atoms, on God's continuing providential relationship to the creation, on free will, and on the existence of a material, immortal human soul that God infused into each individual at the moment of conception. Uh, I'm going to skip a little bit here because it keeps talking about what Gassendi thought about this. So, so you, you see what's happening at this stage, but right? th th there's this new development in, in essentially philosophy, mechanical philosophy, um, new developments in astronomy um, and other discoveries and texts becoming um, rediscovered from the East. People are trying to work out how this fits with the standard neo Aristotelian scholastic views. Uh, and particularly they're worried that these views, which seem to trace back to, you know, um, uh, pagan authors and seem to be kind of mechanistic and atheistic in nature that they undermine god and his relationship providential relationship to nature so so they're trying to fit them together they're trying to uh, understand it so that they can keep god in the picture and find places for him to be so like the free will the human soul the creator these are still things that christian apologists talk about to these day they say well yeah okay so science can explain all this stuff but you can't explain this and that and the other thing. See, th this is this is the modern scientific worldview, right? That the rest of nature can be understood as basically a clockwork obeying laws of nature. This did not exist, not in the way we currently understand it, um, b before this time. This was a novel idea. And although it was Christians developing this, they were concerned about its theological developments. They were reaching back to ancient Greek philosophers and trying to fit the theories together. People like Thomas Hobbes were criticized for being too atheistic. This is not the picture that we're getting from that you get from from the Cameron's video here. So let's read on a little bit more. I'm uh, skipping ahead a little bit here to 147. Although Descartes also articulated fully fledged mechanical philosophy, his ideas were quite different from those of Epicurus. In contrast to Gassendi's atomic view of matter, Descartes claimed that matter fills all space and is infinitely divisible, thus denying the existence of both atoms and the void. He believes that the mat that matter possesses only one primary quality: geometrical extension. Yeah, this is that he was kind of obsessed with. Uh, geometry as well. Uh, this belief provided a foundation for his attempt at mathematization of nature. So note that the application of mathematics here was about his 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 particular beliefs about the geometrical properties of of matter, and not really any particular theolo uh, theological beliefs. And the mathematization of nature is a very important component of modern scientific method, which doesn't seem to have any theological underpinnings at all. Descartes drew a sharp distinction between matter and mind, considering thinking to be the essential characteristic of the mind. So that's, that's the dualist aspect I mentioned before. Now. Uh, read here, Descartes derived his mechanical philosophy directly from theological considerations, so this was very important for him. His rationalist episti epistemology was grounded in the conviction that, since God is not a deceiver, his existence provides a warrant for reasoning from clear and distinct ideas in our minds to knowledge about the created world. Since geometrical concepts are paradigmatic of clear and distinct ideas, we can conclude that the physical world has geometrical properties. It is on such grounds that Descartes justifies the claim that matter is infinitely divisible. The divine attributes also light the base of Descartes' attempts to prove the laws of motion. He appealed to God's immutability to justify his law of conservation of motion and his version of the principle of inertia, the foundations of physics. So it is clear here that Descartes is uh, is um, drawing some conclusions that would regard a scientific conclusion, like basically the conservation of momentum or inertia uh, or similar to that uh, from theological antecedents. But but notice that it's not clear that this really fits with the modern scientific understanding, at least in part. So uh, in in part, uh, in particular, notice it said here that Descartes thought that because God is uh, not a deceiver, God will ensure that our rational thinking about things will allow us to understand or come to an understanding about the world. And that's rationalistic. That's not really empirical. So although, yes, that is modern science does rely on theorizing, Descartes hasn't in this notion really articulated the experimental component of it, or at least not in that component. So again, it's not like he's just reading this off from theological beliefs. Yes, they're playing a role, but they're, there's also being adapted and they're responding to critics and they're bringing in uh, who are other Christian critics and they're bringing in ideas from ancient Greek philosophy as well. Um, yeah, at the bottom of page 147 here, the differences between the mechanical philosophies of Gassendi and Descartes reflect their theological differences concerning providence or God's relationship to the creation. Gassendi was a voluntarist, believing that the created world is utterly contingent on God's will, which is constrained only by the law of contradiction. The contingency of the world rules out the possibility of any kind of rationalistic epistemology because it would embody some kind of necessity, such as a relationship between ideas and our minds and the world. So that seems to be more fitting with how we understand science. It's very empirical. Um, uh, in nature and sort of you, you have to go and look to see how things are. Cassandi's empiricism, probabilism, and the fact that he believed that the matter possesses some properties that can only be known by empirical methods reflect his voluntarist theology. In contrast, Cassandi Descartes believed that although uh, God was entirely free in his creation of the world, he freely created some things to be necessary, eternal truths, uh, which are capable of being known a priori and with certainty. Uh, Descartes' theory of mathematics Oh, sorry, Descartes' theory of matter, according to which matter possesses only geometrical properties that can be known a priori, follows through in this rational epistemology, both his theory of knowledge and his theory of matter are closely associated with theological presuppositions. Another mechanical philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, was 
this specter haunting more orthodox mechanical philosophers. Whatever the save his religious beliefs, which I understand is still controversial, Hobbes' philosophy seemed to the 17th century to be materialistic, deterministic, and possibly even atheistic. Dum, dum, dum. That's not in the book, obviously. I added that. Um, in the elements of philosophy, Hobbes propounded a complete philo philosophy of matter of man and of the state according to mechanical sorry, according to mechanistic principles. Although the details of his mechanical philosophy are not very influential among natural philosophers, uh, were not very influential, his, me his, mechan his mechanical account of the human soul and his thoroughly deterministic account of the natural world alarmed the more orthodox thinkers of his day. So again, this mechanical philosophy was seen as being, could lead into radical directions because they, they look too atheistic, right? This precise idea of the uniformity of nature and the loss of nature operating on mechanical principles was really seen, at least by a lot of people, as a threat to the idea of a god, even if there were also people operating in that space who were trying to reconcile that, like, for example, Descartes and Gassendi. I'm um, just trying to see here. Oh, yeah, it goes on to talk about Boyle as well, uh, who's another one we mentioned, and later it talks about Newton. I just want to see if there's anything else I want to say about, uh, I want to read from here, because this is just really well written, and I think it really illustrates the point here. Um, is there anything else? Okay, let, let me read from page 149 here. Boyle was a deeply religious man who discussed the theological implications of his corpuscular... <laughs> corpuscularianism at great length. He believed that God had created matter and endowed it with motion. God had created laws of nature but could violate those laws at will. Biblical miracles provided evidence for that claim. In, in addition to matter, God creates human souls which he imparts to each embryo individually. That's interesting. He also created angels and demons which are spiritual, not material entities. For Boyle and many other natural philosophers here today, the practice of natural philosophy was an act of worship since it led to greater knowledge of the creator by directly acquainting the careful observer with God's wisdom and benevolence in designing the world. God's purposes are everywhere evident to the astute observer. God is not entirely knowable, however, and neither are his purposes. Boyle was careful to acknowledge the limits of human reasoning and theology, and those limits extend as well to natural philosophy in which human knowledge is limited in scope and is never certain. Boyle's idea was that of the Christian virtuoso who discovered the deep connections between natural philosophy and Christian theology. Okay, I think I'll leave it there, but you're getting the point here. So it's absolutely true that a bunch of these people, such particularly Boyle and Descartes, were motivated or influenced by their theology. But they didn't all have the same theology. I uh, showed that with um, the dis dispute between Descartes and I've already forgotten the name of the other guy there. Wait, uh, that, that's annoying me now. Uh, Descartes and... Uh, uh, that's embarrassing. Gassendi, yeah, uh, about their different theological views. Uh, but also they're drawing upon earlier work from the ancient Greeks and trying to incorporate in that Christian context. So th this is just not the picture at all that we get from from um, uh, from Professor McLeish and Hutchings in this video here. Um, now, they are going to talk a bit more about science in other like non-Christian societies. So um, I've been talking a lot about the mechanical philosophy and how it emerged and its relationship to theology there. Um, let's let's now hear what they have to say about like f about science in non-Christian societies. Um, what Historically. They, did was, uh, they got a spring, okay? Now, when you've probably done this experiment at school, uh, Cameron. You hang a mass on the spring, then you hang... Oh, yes, I forgot. So we're still going on about this Japanese study. Let, let's um, let's have finish it. So they, they asked Japanese, what, school teachers about their attitude to basically Hooke's law. So let's let's go through that. I think this is the one of the stupidest studies that I've heard. But well, I mean, the, the study might be all right, but we'll see how he interprets it. That's kind of dumb. Hang a bit more, then you hang a bit more. And each time you write down how long the spring has gone. Okay. I mean, now if that's not fun, I don't know what it is. Right? So you do this and then you get some results and maybe um, your results look something like this. So we've got force against extension. Okay. And maybe, um, maybe my results look like this. Now, Cameron, what should I do next? Uh, you could come up with a hypothesis well, that explains yeah, the dots. This is, I mean, I don't want to be a bit mean on Cameron because he's being put on the spot here, but it, <laughs> it kind of undermines the point that, uh, that that Dave is making here. But I mean, so what do people what do people think in the chat? What, what Dave is asking here is, what should you do next? What you've got we've got there? Any ideas? I, I'm curious as to whether you get the right answer. This look for. I mean, I guess some of you may have watched the video, so you know what he's talking about here. Cameron doesn't get the right answer. <laughs> well, he sort of did, right? He said you form a hypothesis. That's kind of correct, but. It's not not exactly. I'll just wait a minute because see if anyone wants to. Someone says join the dots. I'm not going to say whether. How do you, diastrophysicist and oh dear, philos <laughs> philosophilistine philosophilistine. Jeez, you're making it hard. Yeah, so people are saying join the dots line of best fit. Yeah, that, that's what I thought as well. So, some insane. I like that. Um, I don't think that's what he was going for, though. Yeah, he was going for join the dots. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if you if you handed that graph to me, Cameron, 
you would not get full marks because it's missing something. Okay. Do, do, you know, do you know what it's missing? I can't see the full thing. Let me pull it back up on the screen. Uh... Some of your listeners will hopefully have said in the comments what you should do next or what we what you've been taught to do next. No? It's been too long for me. <laughs> Sorry, Cameron. <laughs> You just oh, falsified. Is that what? No, yeah, it's one case, obviously, but I just found it amusing. Okay, you should draw a line of best fit. Okay, so you draw <laughs> a line that you kind of feel represents the points. Okay. Um, I've got really poor resolution on my camera. Can you guys see clearly or not? Oh, it's very clear. Yeah, it's very clear. Okay. Um, so there we go. So we draw a line through it. Now, here's a big question for you. Why? Why would you draw a line, a straight line of best fit? That's not what your results were. Okay. Your results were actually this. Um, they were the points, right? So you always. Resolve... What do people think an answer to this question? I don't think Cameron, try Cameron tries to answer this, but um, because he's going to give four options that were given in the study, and he's going to say that the Japanese teachers picked the wrong one. That's the basic idea. But um, I'm I'm curious as to, I mean, you haven't given you the options yet, but if people have thoughts on, what's it like? Simple, like couple of word explanation of why you draw a line of best fit. What's the sort of purpose or maybe justification of that? Results. As he's you working towards to that. Your results. You should do dot to dot. Those are your actual results, the dot to dot line, right? So why is everybody told to draw a straight line through them? Well, they asked this question to these um, these uh, scientists in Japan. And they I said, thought they were teachers. You know, why should someone uh, be told to draw a line through I'm them? I'm not they, sure. They I gave them a multiple choice question. And they said, um, here are your four options for saying, you know, why you should draw a straight line through it. Option one, it's the most simple of all the possible shapes. Okay? Option one is it's the most simple of all the shapes. Option two um, is there is a law of nature that tells you how force acts on springs. And the law of nature is a straight line, and that law is true about our universe. Okay, um, and and therefore extendable to all springs at all times in all places everywhere. Third option: if you did this experiment lots of times, it would eventually average out as a straight line. Okay, and then the fourth option, because that's what most scientists say you should do, like a kind of appeal to authority or to consensus. Now, um, overwhelmingly, seven oh, so before he gives you the results, so I'll just give people a uh, chance to maybe revise their vote given the options that he said. So it was basically uh, because it's a simplest option, because there's a law of nature that says that's how it works, because if we did the experiment many times, that's the straight line is what it looked like, and because that's what most scientists say to do. Um, well, that's the way it's, uh, I mean, to be honest, number four is the actual reason why most students do this, because they're told to, right? <laughs> I take that people here would at least agree that that's not sort of the justification for why it's done. Um, so we can, we can sort of eliminate that one, but, um, the thing is, though, that uh, it's sort of not obvious that any of the first three are wrong. I mean, none of them are really wrong, right? But at least you'd say four is not really a justification. It's just sort of an explanation of it. Um, and so, yeah, I was thinking that people, someone said C, so I've got to remember the order. So the first one was definitely that it's the simplest line that you can fit through it. The second one was that there's a law of nature. And the third one is that it, yeah, it's what you'd see if you did the experiment many times. Um, and I mean, all of them are true to an extent, right? And we'll see. I'll explain that more in a moment. But so already, I, I'm not much of a fan of this study because it's like, well, <laughs> I mean, we, I don't know that there's one correct option here. There's just different ways of looking at it. Um, yeah. So this is a good point, though. It's not necessarily obvious why you'd, you'd pick linear regression. Uh, I mean, it depends on how good the fit is, right? And in fact, that this is what is done, right? You you look at different fits, and I mean, a simpler fit is usually preferred. So if you can get a linear fit that is just as good as a polynomial fit, then you, you go with the linear fit because it's simpler. It, in, it, it involves estimating fewer parameters, right? So, um, ah, well, someone's already already jumped the gun a bit here, but <laughs> uh, yeah, so the point is that, you know, you, you can argue for a lot of these, but apparently there was a right answer. So let, let's see. Oh, and apparently the Japanese teachers or scientists or whatever gave the wrong answer. 71% of the respondents, these uh, Japanese respondents said, the reason you should do it is that if you did the experiment lots of times, that's what the data would average out. In other words, they're saying, um, if you want to know how something is going to behave, the only way that you can know how it's going to behave is to do the experiment lots and lots and lots of times and pull your data, and that will tell you the result. And hardly any of them, um, only 16% said, because there is a law of nature, right? Now, does that mean that Japanese people can't do science? Clearly not. They have better science in Japan than they do in most places. But what it does mean is that they couldn't have... So who cares about your whole point? Like, even if his point is true, right? <laughs> he just seems to admit that it doesn't matter in the slightest because you can still do science without it. So again, I don't understand why this even matters, but put let, let me just finish this point and then I'll explain why it's nonsense. Got science started in the first place because the foundations aren't there. And so with that philosophical worldview underneath that says, we don't believe that there are any laws underpin underpinning everything, then you lose that ability to put together um, 
uh, science as we understand it, right? You've got F equals KE is the underlying law in that case, which incidentally is Hooke's law. And Hooke was a flatmate of Robert Boyle back in the uh, 1600s. Um, it doesn't mean anything about technology. And so the second part of my answer, what about societies that have developed other technologies and they're not Christian societies? Well, they have developed technology and technology is quite different. Technology doesn't require the use of underlying laws. Technology can be a hands-on trial and error. You know, we've done this and it works. We don't know why it works, but it does work, right? Um, and so we're not making the case that technology needs God, okay? Um, uh, or needs Christianity. You can do that independently. And the same with maths. It seems that maths can arise, you know, almost independently of any kind of philosophical background. But science, this idea of natural law, and then using that natural law to extend and relate to other areas, um, that has only ever appeared, only ever appeared within a Judeo-Christian culture. It hasn't appeared anywhere else. This idea of natural law where you write down fundamental ideas that you consider to be immutable and that you consider to be universal, right? That, that is, um, and so that underpins what we would describe as, as modern science. All right, so that's the big claim there. This idea of writing down natural laws that are immutable and universal underpins science. And this experiment is supposed to demonstrate that that's not natural to the Japanese, traditional way of Japanese thinking. Now, I mean, it may not be, uh, to it may not run naturally to traditional Japanese thinking. I, I don't know so much about that. It also seems kind of irrelevant because Japan's moved a long way from, you know, <laughs> the last 150 years since they sort of opened up to the outside world. So I don't know how much you can say that, uh, you know, Western educated um, science teachers or scientists in Japan are even thinking traditionally, but putting that to the side. So do Christians think that the laws of nature are immutable? Depends which Christian you ask, of course, because there's different views on this. But in general, no, because they believe in miracles, right? <laughs> this is the whole point of a miracle, that there's some sort of, I mean, some Christians want to say, well, it's not a violation of law. It's an appeal to some sort of higher underpinning law or something like that. But I mean, to me, that's just a bit of uh, a bit, a bit of moving the goalposts. Like the, the idea of the law of nature as studied in science doesn't allow for miracles. And in order for a miracle to happen, th the law is, is violated or, or waived or superseded or whatever you want to call it uh, for the miracle to happen. So it seems to me that it's actually the naturalist who says there's no violation of laws of nature. That's just the, it, the laws of nature describe the way the natural world works, and that's all there is. They actually have uh, a better ability to sort of work with science in that context, at least according to his argument, right? Because th there's no violations of the laws of nature there, whereas they, there are in Christianity. And the problem is, how do you know when God's going to violate a law of nature and do a miracle? You don't know, <laughs> because, because God's purposes are not our purposes, right? And he's far above us. So at any given moment, when I'm a, a Christian doing science, it seems that I have to worry about, well, maybe God has a reason to like tinker with my test tube here or with my, you know, population study that I'm doing or with my, um, you know, telescope results, or, you know, whatever it is like, well, there could be a miracle here. How would I know? Right. In fact, I, I think it's basically by being atheistic materialists that Christians are able to do science because they basically just assume that that doesn't happen. Because if they really thought it was going to happen like regularly, that, that, that God was going to intervene, then they, they couldn't do this science, right? Because who knows what God would do? So I think that this works against him. Like the, the uniform, the, because the laws of nature are not immutable, according to most Christians who believe in miracles, then you don't actually know when God's going to intervene and kind of the whole idea of uniformity becomes suspect. It's only by basically ignoring that, just sort of compartmentalizing it away that you're, you're able to continue to do science, it seems to me. Um, but so Christians don't believe in immutable laws. Also, let's just nitpick the example. <laughs> Is Hooke's law a law of nature? No, of course it's not. Right? I mean, people in the chat pointed this out. It's only a first approximation. Um, so many springs will have a sort of a, a linear region where there's a linear relationship between the force applied and the, and the stretch. But but there's a point at which I forget what the name of it's called, it's like the elastic limit or something like that, where it, it, it becomes nonlinear. Um, so it's not a universal law of nature anyway. It's just it's a silly example. I mean, the thing is, it's actually hard to find universal laws of nature apart from looking at very fundamental physics, because almost everything is just an approximation within a given context. And this is why I said it, you don't even need laws of nature to do science, except maybe for fundamental physics. At every other level of science, it's basically just approximations and models which work in a con in a given context. But if you apply it outside, it doesn't make sense or there's limits to it. So you don't need fundamental laws there uh, to, to make sense of that. So I think that the whole idea is dramatically overblown. Um, and um, yeah, so the Hooke's law, for example, is particularly silly. Now let's talk about their results in that study. It seems to me that the if I were to pick one answer to that question, it probably, it, well, it was, it was C. It was the idea that if you did the experiment many times, you would see this this line. Um, because it's not true that Hooke's law is a universal law. I mean, it, it would generally apply to you know, springs or general springs over that sort of range of forces. Um, but is it a law of nature? I mean, I wouldn't say that that's a law of nature, right? It's really a just, a, just a description of a particular phenomena. Um, and so I, I certainly wouldn't call it a fundamental law. Maybe you could call it a more derived law. We could argue about that. But that just seems unnecessary and um, 
a bit profligate. It, it, I think it's better to just say, yeah, if you did the experiment a lot of times, you'd expect your results to basically fit more or less along the line or like be scattered around the line. I guess you could say if you did the experiment many times and average it out, you'd expect it to be at the line. And that's kind of the point of doing a line of best fit, actually. You're, you're trying to see what the sort of average would be, if you like, if you had more results than you do. It's, it's a way of visualizing the relationship. And you, you can do statistical tests on it and so forth. But uh, so, you know, I, I'm not saying you can't argue for some of the other options. That was the point earlier, that it's sort of ambiguous. But this study just seems to be complete because it's not clear that the answer was wrong. In fact, it seems that it's the best answer. But it's also possible that other answers are defensible too. Um, it's not clear that this even is a law of nature. In fact, I think it's clearly not a law of nature. Um, and, and it's not clear that laws of nature even matter for doing, <laughs> for doing science, or at least almost all science. So I think just it, it's just, oh, pl plus it's not clear that this gets at any, to anything about traditional Japanese beliefs because we don't have a comparison between what Westerners would say and what you know Japanese scientists or science teacher or whoever they are would say that we've, we've just got the one case so what would they say in the US what would they say in Germany what would they say in you know a different country so we don't have the comparison there so it's completely useless everything about this is basically pointless now maybe I don't know what they were actually trying to do in the original study so maybe the authors had a, a, a different hypothesis they were testing I don't know I, I, it just seems so dumb that I decided not to read it and I, I think we, we saw enough of it from what he said there at least that was how he was deploying the paper right so I think it's fair to critique that so anyway um so um, yeah, very silly example, but also I think illustrates the idea that you just you don't need laws of nature to do almost all science. Maybe not even any science, but because you can just treat it as empirical regularities that are that are predictive, right? So why do you need laws of nature? It's completely unclear. But let's now move to the next point there. Irrespective of whether you need laws of nature to do science, maybe you need the idea of it to like kickstart science, like look for these regularities. So that's a different point, right? And this is what we talk about in the mechanical philosophy. So what David's saying here is that it's it's only in a Christian context. Well, it says Dave here. I hope I've been calling him David, so I hope he's actually I guess I should call him Dave if that's what he goes by here. But but what Dave has been saying here is that they only emerge in a Christian context. Is that true? Well, we've already seen that it's not true, right? Because we were just talking about how um Epicurus <laughs> argued for basically this mechanistic idea of nature, which is borderline atheistic naturalistic, um, back in uh, hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. So you can't say that's in a Judeo-Christian context. Um, furthermore, there is a very famous work called On the Nature of Things. Well, I mean, that's the English translation. The, the Latin is De Rerum Natura. I can't speak Latin, by Lucretius. Um, and he was basically arguing for, again, within the context of Epicurean philosophy, he was arguing for essentially a mechanistic, naturalistic worldview um, that things operate according to, uh, you know, physical forces. Um, and that was published, when was that published? I've got the date here, first century BC. So, you know, a hundred years before Jesus. Um, so th this is just false. <laughs> that, 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 was, that There was no conception of like regular natural laws operating outside of Judeo Christian context, you only have to look back to the ancient Greeks uh, who thought about this. Uh, and indeed, that was directly influential in the early Christians who were thinking about this as well. They were looking back to them and then trying to synthesize that within the Christian context, uh, within the Christian worldview, and you know, debating about that. But furthermore, um, in order to get around the problem that for a long time, the Islamic world and the Chinese world were sort of world leaders in, in science and technology, what they want to do is say, well, okay, you can have you can have technology and mathematics without, you know, uh, this idea of regular nature, but you can't have science. Um, now, it's, it's true that there is a difference between technology, which is more applied, and science, which is more theoretical. That just, uh, and today we think of them as having, as being like fairly closely related, but in the pre-modern world, this wasn't really the case. A lot of technologists didn't really do like theoretical work in the way that we would think about it. So, so there is some truth to this. But we shouldn't push that too far, right, and say that they're totally separable because because they're not. Um, they, they, they do go together. Um, and what do I want to say about this? So there's there's two good Wikipedia articles here. Maybe I'll just sort of share these to illustrate the richness that there is here to look at rather than just making these sort of ridiculous blanket statements, um, this sort of blanket misrepresentation of, of scholarship really does annoy me, which is one of the reasons I wanted to do this stream. OK, so let's start with, is that working? Yeah, uh, let's just make it bigger. All right, here we go. So this article here, History of Science and Technology in China, this is a very uh, lively area of research because for quite a long time, China was a world leader in technology um, and uh, sort of for different periods. But one of the, um, the the Tang Dynasty and then also the, the Song Dynasty, which followed that were particular periods of, of, of innovation. Um, 
they kind of slowed up a lot more in, in especially the Qing dynasty, which was the, the last dynasty. Um, Joseph Needleman, oh, sorry, Needham has done a, a lot of good work on this point. Uh, he's written prolifically on this. But what did I, what do I want to emphasize here? Oh, yeah. So um, oh, I don't want to make it too small. So in the particularly the, like the, the, the Tang and the Sung dynasties, there was a lot of very practical work um, in particularly chemistry, like obviously Chinese invented gunpowder, we know that. Um, and in what else I want to say, pharmacology, clocks, magnetism, metallurgy, mathematics as well. Alchemy was big. I mean, that was big in the Christian world as well. So there was lots and lots of technological development here. Um, now, there, there seems to be some interesting points here about the relationship between practice and theories. I mean, I don't I can't really validate this, but I'll just read what it says here because I think it's kind of interesting. Oh, bugger. Uh, was it gone? I hate it how it does that when you zoom in. Here we go. Pre-modern Chinese science developed precariously, that's an interesting word, without solid scientific theory, while there was a lacking of a consistent systematic treatment in comparison to contemporaneous European works. Uh, this drawback to Chinese science was lamented even by the mathematician Yang Hui, who criticized early mathematicians such as Li Chung Feng, who were content with using methods without working out the theoretical, theoretical origin of principles, saying the men of old challenged, oh sorry, not challenged, changed the name of their methods from problem to problem, so that as no specific explanation was given, there is no way of telling their theoretical origin or basis. Despite this, Chinese thinkers of the Middle Ages pro some hypothesis which are in constant modern principles of science, and it talks some examples of this. Um, I, I mean, I don't know too much about that. There does seem to have been a bit of a different focus in, in Chinese philosophy, in Chinese sort of what, what I might call proto science. Um, so I don't want to say that there's no truth to what Dave was saying there, but like the idea that there wasn't science in you know pre modern China, if Again, there's the narrow and the broad notion of science, but if we're working with the broad notion, there absolutely was, right? Um, and did the Chinese have a view of regularity in nature? Well, that's sort of contentious, right? Uh, Chinese philosophy has this notion of the of the Tao, which is well, very <laughs> well. I guess I'll bring up the article, right? It's it's extremely hard to define this idea. Uh, it, it's sort of both order and disorder. I don't. So it literally means the way, right? Um, so as it says here, Tao is the natural lord of the universe's character once human intuition must discern in order to realize the potential for human wisdom. The basic idea is that you want to sort of match the way you behave with the way of the Tao. But it's not like you don't do that like by rigidly following a set of rules. You do that by trying to like go with the flow, I guess, would be the way we describe it in Western philosophy. Um, but I mean, the thing is that there was an idea that you can't really understand the Tao. The Tao is sort of ineffable. And so it was kind of anti-rationalistic in that sense, although, I mean, uh, I know that that's going to be controversial as well. So the point there is that there was an idea of sort of uh, of sort of order and uniformity, but th there was also, uh, I think, an idea that it was beyond human understanding. But of course, that's not, I mean, th those underpinnings are also in, in Greek and Christian theory as well. So I, the point is, can we say that the reason why ch that China didn't have a scientific revolution in the way that early modern Europe did is because they lacked this idea of a sort of rational order of things uh, sorry a, a regular order of world that was rationally accessible i have no idea if that was true or not because there's so many factors going on there that like how do you work this out I, <laughs> you have to somehow web all of the different intellectual threads of a civilization compare them to all the different electrical threads of a different civilization and then compare that to like the political developments economic developments um and, and extraneous developments like you know dynasties being overthrown and things like that the effect of geography and all these other things I, how can you say? I, I don't know whether that was the effect or not, uh, whether that was important or not. I, I, I'm pretty suspicious of these sorts of very sort of reductionistic explanations which say, oh, the reason why China didn't have uh, a, a scientific revolution is because they didn't believe in a rationally accessible order of nature. I, I, I'm pretty suspicious of that. Um, yeah, so this is, I don't claim to be an expert. I've studied a little bit about this. Um, yeah, it has a lot of different interpretations, which is kind of the point that I'm making, right? It's not like they didn't have an idea, but like, well, is it different? Is it the same? And how does it relate to Like, I have no idea. Really. <laughs> I'm sure you could you could talk to a bunch of skulls on it and they tell you different things as well. It's very complicated and hard to and hard to uh, assess there. But Dave thinks he knows and, and can say that that's the reason why. Now, let's also look at and uh, let's look at the Islamic world. And this is actually worse for Dave, right? The reason that the science in the Islamic world is worse for Dave or his thesis, I suppose, is because obviously the um, you know uh, scientists or proto scientists and, and scholars in the medieval Islamic world were theists, and they actually borrowed from a lot of similar um, philosophical tradition that the Christians did, although working in their own framework. And they and they believed in the Bible as well. Like, well, you know, they believed it had problems, but they believed in many of the same prophets and um, believed that 
um, you know, they were still worshiping the God of the Old Testament. Um, many of you will be aware of the, it's mentioned here somewhere, the, uh, the um, Islamic Renaissance, which extended from like the 8th through 13th centuries, depending on who you ask. Um, and, and this was a period when the Islamic world was really the world leader in, in a lot of scientific results. So there's so much that was inherited in terms of chemistry, astronomy and cosmology, botany, geography, uh, mathematics, um, medicine, optics, pharmacology, physics, zoology, like all of this stuff was, was leaps and bounds ahead of what was being done in Western Europe. And much of it was borrowed in the like, you know, 13th and 14th centuries, um, around the same time when Aristotle and so on was being discovered, rediscovered. Um, there were also um, the Crusades and then later um, uh, interactions within um, Spain, which was sort of divided between the Christians and Muslims, uh, all helps to sort of provide these ideas and, and um, allow them to be sort of adopted into the into Western science. Um, but the Western world was well behind for, for many hundreds of years. Um, and so um, the idea that science, or at least proto-science, again, is it broad on error? I would call this proto science because I don't think it's strictly what we would regard as science. But but clearly it's it's in like along a similar trajectory, right? So uh, proto science was clearly possible in the Islamic world and, and flourished there for hundreds of years. Now there wasn't a scientific revolution there. Um, a lot of people a lot of people think that the Mongol invasions of the 13th century, which devastated large not the entirety of the Middle East but large parts of it, were were significant for that. Others blame theological developments, um, and it gets complicated. The Ottoman Empire came later, and that seems to have been less uh, propitious for scientific development. But again, the issue is it gets it gets hard. Like, how do you identify all the causal factors here? Um, the problem is, though, that that Muslims did have an idea, a, a idea of a creator God who you know who made the world. Um, I don't know enough about Islamic theology to say exactly the relationship they thought that the creator had towards the creation and so forth. There's a chapter in this book about that actually, which would be good to look into. But I, I didn't. Um, didn't get to that before this recording. But again, the point is, what is it distinctively about Christian theology as distinct from Islamic theology, which meant that Christian theology was able to have a scientific, you know, was able to generate a scientific revolution, according to Dave here, but but the Islamic world wasn't, even though the Islamic world was ahead in science or proto-science for hundreds of years at a time when the Christian world was lagging behind. The Christian world eventually surpassed the Islamic world, maybe at some time in the 15th, 16th century, hard to say exactly when, um, was that because of the theology? I mean, the theology didn't change, right? Obviously, there were theological developments, but they were still Christian and they were still Muslim for like a, a thousand years before that, or nearly a thousand years uh, in the Islamic case, longer in the Christian case. Uh, and, and suddenly, it's the effect of science only takes, uh, only like they, they get the foot there on the accelerator in the 17th century. It doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense is, is the point I'm making here. The true origin of the scientific revolution is to be understood in a particular historical context of 17th century Europe, as the interaction of thoughts of, uh, the, of of new ideas coming, well, ideas being rediscovered both from the Islamic world and from ancient Greeks, interacting with the existing um, theological and philosophical milieu that existed in Europe at the time, and with the burgeoning technology and and commerce that was increasingly picking up um, for, from the 17th century, at least in certain parts of Europe. Um, so there's a very complex causal picture to, to talk about there. Um, Ah, actually, this is an interesting point. So people have talked about the printing press in the in the um, in the Islamic world. The printing press was uh, regarded with a lot of skepticism in the Islamic world, from what I've read, and was adopted very slowly. Part of this, I believe, was because I, I don't know if it's actually because Arabic per se was unsuitable. I guess you've got the diacritics, which makes things harder. I do know that calligraphy was extremely important. Well, it still is in in the Islamic world, and um, therefore there was some sort of a lot of resistance towards just sort of printing. Um, uh, that came from from leaders. Uh, I haven't really talked about the idea of the printing press as being important. That was certainly very important for disseminating scientific ideas, um, and that was something that the Islamic world didn't have. But again, I, I, I don't think you can say that it's any one factor like this. There's many factors going on. Because again, it's not... The problem is finding things that are exogenous, right? Like, why did the printing press take off in Europe and not, say, in the Islamic world? Like, it, you can't just say, well, science took off in Europe because of the the printing press, but then why, why did they have the printing press and not the Islamic world? Why didn't the Islamic world invent the printing press? And see, that's a technology. The printing press is not really science, it's more technology. And this is why science and technology interact with each other in a very important way. And this actually leads to an important point when, when David's saying, oh, it's not science, it's not, sorry, it's not technology, it's not mathematics. No, we're talking about science here. But you can't really separate them because if you think about the two key characteristics of the mechanical philosophy and modern science, what are they? It's experiments and mathematization. What do you need for experiments? You need technology. If you don't have the ability to conduct the experiments, then you're not going to get 
the results you need. And for mathemat math mathematizability, you need mathematics. So the two key things that Dave is saying that are distinct from science are actually two key ingredients into the success of science. And I think that part of the puzzle is that Europe was more advanced by, certainly by the 17th century, maybe a little before then, was technologically, like, you know, clocks and glasswork and metallurgy and many of these other areas were technologically more advanced than uh, than China and the Islamic world by, let's say, the 17th century. Um, and, and maybe a little before in, in, in some areas, it, you, you can debate the timing, but, um, and like printing press would be another example of that. Uh, and mathematically, I think that they were also beginning to ed edge ahead around that time. I don't know as much about that, but probably, yeah, 17th century would be about the time when I think that they're, uh, certainly by the time Newton develops calculus, they're, they're ahead of what anyone else was able to achieve. Um, so those are key ingredients into the ability to give rise to a scientific revolution, like, because you have more mathematical ability and you have the technology to be able to develop more precise experiments. Think about the invention of the telescope. So the skill with glass working led to the development of the telescope, which led Galileo to be able to make his observations, which under which undermined or contributed to undermining an Aristotelian worldview. So that's a technological development leading to scientific and ultimately sort of theological and philosophical developments. Um, and this point has actually been kind of brought up and discussed in a new approach to well, I don't know how new it is. It's somewhat new to philosophy of science called the new experimentalism. Um, the basic idea is that traditionally philosophy of science has focused a lot on theory developments. Um, and obviously that's important. But the new experimentalists are basically saying, well, hang on a minute. Experiment is actually very important for development of science as well. And experiments can often lead to new theoretical findings um, and, and changing the way we think about things. But experimentation in turn depends not just on theory, but also on technological limitations. So basically, technology can actually be a driving factor in science rather than kind of resulting from science. So we often think that scientific progress leads to new technologies, and that, that certainly does happen. But actually, the idea is that, at least plausibly historically, it was actually often the other way around. Technological developments led to improved ability to conduct experiments, which then lead to scientific progress. And of course, it can be a, a feedback loop then, self-reinforcing. So anyway, there's 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 lots of there's lots of stuff here to get into. Um, and I'm just sort of talking about some of the general points to be raised here. But the, the overall picture is, can we say with any confidence that the reason why, say, the Islamic world or the Chinese, the Chinese civilization did not experience a scientific revolution in the way of 17th century Europe, is because of some sort of theological deficiency. No, we can't say that. There is nowhere near enough evidence to conclude that. And there's a lot of reasons to think that that's suspect, such as that they did have ideas of natural law, albeit in their own ways, um, such as that the fact that Europe had this idea for a long time and didn't lead to a scientific revolution, such as the fact that it seems that there's many other factors that are relevant, like technological level, commercial level, political stability, and on and on, that are also important um, and that aren't theological in nature at all. Um, and, and so, uh, oh, and plus the fact that the Christians were often borrowing from older uh, ancient Greeks who developed many of these ideas um, in a non-Christian context. So, so this, the entire story that's being told basically by, um, in, in this um, uh, in this video, I think is, is just misleading. It's a completely misleading, cherry-picked uh, description of, of how science originated. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we're, so... Getting near the end here, let's just, I can't remember what else I have to say. Skip this bit. Yeah, I screwed up again. Thanks, chat. <laughs> it's all right. I haven't got to anything yet. In I'm just skipping so, ahead. And also in the book, you say it has the resources right, to keep should us be honest, fixed now. to hope for better theories, to change our minds, our minds to expect a world of order, and so on. So my question is, and this will maybe kind of summarize some of the things that we talked about today, how does it follow from all of that that science needs God? That, that's, I think, a way of explaining how science came about. But what is the argument that science needs God? It seems possible, at least, that science could flourish in a godless world, even if that's improbable. Well, we said, of course, we, science can flourish in a godless world for the, for the same reason once it got once it's got started for the same reason that agriculture and medicine and art and sing god is a god is super generous um and you know he does and only give good things um uh, to, to those to on sort of bartering way um uh, sign up to serve him he's actually 
his, throughout the story of the Bible. He's used people outside his family and he's blessed them. He's, he's, that's part of his character. I think that needs to be needs to be said uh, this evening. But there is a sense in which science needs God in all sorts of ways today, not just to get started, but to carry on. Um, I'm Dave and I are both concerned about some of the moves in both our countries, the US and the UK and other countries as, as, as well, to to marginalise science, to minimise it, to push it away. Um, well, and you know, Dave's made some examples. Um, uh, the the way that science has helped us understand how. Is that coming from atheists, naturalists, or is that coming more from Christians or even from other? religious traditions as well i mean it's true that there are some anti-scientific um uh traditions i guess you might say f that that are atheistic um so new age i mean not that's exactly a i don't know what would call that exactly but i mean there's people from sort of in that space who are definitely anti-science in various ways uh so it, it's true that it's not like you know monolithic one side or the other but I would say that, I mean, they're, they're worried about people marginalizing science, but I'm wondering which side that's sort of more coming from, or wh who's the biggest threat, w which worldview maybe is the biggest threat to science these days. I don't think it's naturalism. How vaccines work and how we can cure and erase, eradicate horrible diseases like polio from um, uh, from the face of the planet. How science tells us how we need to be careful about what we do with our planet now because we're causing the climate to change. And yet we're living in a world where the gift, the God-given and thereby trustworthy gift of science is sometimes politically marginalized if what it says isn't comfortable to the ears of those in power. And if that sounds a little bit like the way that the kings in the Old Testament would marginalize the prophets if they didn't like what they were saying, um, then that's because it's a very similar picture. But the people of God can act as sort of light in a society. One thing the church should, should value high above many other things is truth. Um, Thomas valued truth, Christ valued truth, and science also shares this wonderful valuation of truth. So when so, so it's one thing to say that you value truth. It's another thing to exhibit behaviours which um, are consistent with that. Now, I, this isn't a comment against uh, Tom specifically here. I, I don't, I obviously don't know him, but I'm talking more generally here. So let's go back to the Downing Thomas example. So if you value truth, um, will you? Ex so, so let's say Jesus values truth. So would you expect him to either a say, you know, blessed are those who you know seek the evidence and only believe on the basis of evidence, or b say, you know, blessed are those who uh, believe without seeing, right? Which of those is more consistent with someone who values truth? Uh, I think it's pretty clear that if you actually value truth, then you will make sure that your behavior and teachings are consistent with behaviors that lead to more true beliefs, not just believing without evidence, for example. That's not consistent with 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 um, valuing truth. And and likewise, with sort of Christian practice more generally, I, I don't actually know how, well, let me say it this way. In my experience, talk of skepticism or of seeking evidence or of being open-minded is generally not particularly well received in a lot of Christian circles. Obviously, I'm not like not 100, but in general, I would say that, that like doubt and skepticism are, are seen as negative things, and, and even like science uh, and and secular philosophy are seen as potentially leading to doubt and potentially leading to problems. That's not consistent with truth seeking, right? And and I think that this is really um, this is a really negative influence that religion, a lot of religious traditions not all of them but a lot of them still have on people today is 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 really not um engaging in behaviors or promoting ways of thinking that are conducive to to truth seeking and that's because that's what i value i that's one of the reasons i value skepticism so highly is because i think it's what you do when you value truth a lot and i think if religion or religious traditions or perspectives or approaches to religion don't encourage that then uh it, to that extent they are harmful society or certain elements in society start saying things that are untruthful uh, go against the evidence throw this gift back in god's face for example that you should um, not vaccinate your children um then uh, it should be the church the lovers of truth and those who understand that this is a gift from god who support the healthy and the righteous use of gifts like this so um maybe science needs a uh, a faithful church is one way of unpacking uh, what we mean when we say science needs god dave do you have any thoughts yeah, I think um, in a lot of ways we've, we've we've tried to make this point that um, you know there needs to be the right sort of philosophical mindset in place before you can do any science, right? There needs to be the right sort of theological mindset in place. Except that he's argued that you don't need any particular type of theological mindset, and you can still do science perfectly well. So there's a contradiction here. This is what I keep saying: if it doesn't actually make any difference, then what's the argument supposed to be? If the argument that is it needed a particular theological mindset to uh, for the origin of science, well, we've we've gone through at length and seen why that's at most charitable, a gross oversimplification. Uh, and, and I think it's it's actually fair to say it's flat out wrong uh, in, in the way that he wants, at least. Yes, there were particular worldviews that went into the origin of science in 17th century Europe, but basically this is the mechanical philosophy. Um, 
and like it's it's not just Christianity. It, it's a particular way of understanding Christianity in relation to the mechanical philosophy and and being able to reconcile it with this basically ancient Greek thought and it's apparently materialistic way, mechanical way of thinking about the universe um, and, and tr trying to fit it in with with God while you know dispensing with enough of scholasticism to um, to adopt the new method while also keeping sort of God in the picture by allowing for miracles or a divine soul or things like that. Um, it's just not what Dave has been saying at all that like, oh, well, they just knew that God ordered the natural world and wanted us to understand it. So then they just thought about the idea of doing science. If that's how it went, then we'd expect science to the scientific revolution to have occurred in like fifth century um, or fourth or fifth century, um, you know, Roman empire, but it, it did not. I mean, or maybe even in the 13th century when Thomas Aquinas rediscovered uh, Aristotle, who we all know was a great Christian philosopher. He wasn't, by the way, Aristotle was, was, a, was a pagan. But um, so, I mean, there's not even a, the point, there's not even a separation between, <laughs> between like Christian philosophers and, and non-Christian philosophers, that they're intermingled. And so you can't just pick this bit and say, oh, that's the Christian bit, right? It, it, it's not even how it works. But the, so the whole, the whole framework here is saying you need a Christian underpinning to, for science to begin just doesn't even make sense at the outset because it's kind of like saying, look at the worldview of those who were developing the scientific method. Was Christianity part of it? Yes, well, then it was necessary. But there, were, there were lots of other things that are part of it as well. You can't just pick one bit that you like and say that was necessary when there were all these other things going on as well. I could just as easily say, with more justification, that a mechanistic uh, view about the material world was essential uh, and that that was actually critical uh, and that you can hold that irrespective of whether you believe in God or not. In fact, as I said before, I think it works better if you don't believe in God because then there's you're not worried about whether he's going to miracle up some different result. You just say, well, that's the way matter works and then it's, it's always going to be consistent with that before you can do any science um and and so and I, hopefully people can go back and watch those bits again or they can buy the book and have a read of that um i think don't buy their books by this one it's much better god has made us in his image he's made us god is creative so we are creative because we're like him god is um reasonable so we are reasonable because we're like him and so on um and also so because we're sinful and we're made in the image of god that god must also be sinful Oh, wait, no, that, that can't be right. Okay, let's try again. So because we are often irrational and ignorant and have cognitive biases and memory distortions, then God must also have that. No, no, that's not going to work. Um, okay, let's try another. So because we are embodied and have finite lives and gradually deteriorate and die, that means God will also have a body and deteriorate. No, oh, dang it. It's almost as if whenever they want to say, whenever Christians want to say that we're like God in some way, they say we're made in the image of God and God's like that. But whenever there's something that, is different between us and God. They say, oh, that's the fall. So they can explain everything. Like if if, if there's something that we're similar to God, oh, that's because we're made in His image. If it's different, oh, it's the fall. The problem with this is that because it explains everything, it explains nothing. It's totally useless as an explanation, or, or as an underpinning for anything. It's just like <laughs> if it's a good thing, oh, God. Uh, if it's a bad thing, oh, the fall. Useless as an explanation. The, the, the most significant thing that God has done is He's created us to join in a relationship with him. God is relational, right? God is three in one. Um, there's friendship, there's love, there's community. Shouldn't we be three in one then if we're made in God's image? In God, he creates us, um, human beings all over the world. I've got um, brothers and sisters all over the world that God has said, come and be in friendship, come and be in community, come and be in love. And, and we've got this amazing thing in common. And, and, um, and so what I'd say is that this, this sort of invitation to be scientific is a small part of a bigger picture. And just like, when you watch a really good musical, you can it's sort of, you can transcend a little bit and you think, wow, I feel like I'm part of something bigger. There's something bigger going on here. Um, or you watch an amazing film or you read an incredible poem or whatever. Um, that, that science can do that too. When you sit and you watch an incredible science documentary, um, what it should do is sort of transport you. If science is done properly, it should be transporting you into this world of wonder. And, um, and I think you do get that sense from people like, say, for example, Neil deGrasse Tyson and others who are these science presenters. They're clearly like transported to this sense of awe and wonder and yet they don't land on the source of it all. And um, and the source of it all is a God and Father who's so kind to us. Um, so uh, perhaps what science could do is try and get back um, a bit more of the transcendental. Uh... Yeah, God doesn't need science. I, I, I wouldn't know where this idea of science comes from, like from the New Testament. Like where does God say, you know, go ye, the, <laughs> go ye to the ends of the earth and acquire all of the experimental evidence that you can and, and you know, collate the natural species and construct ye uh, a, a mechanical philosophy with uh, mathematization of nature. There's nothing like that <laughs> in the New Testament. Like this is they're just making this up post hoc. And granted, there were, as we've seen, people who believed this, like Descartes, for example, believed that this was a way of worshiping, right? But this was a this was a late development that this, this particular way of understanding uh, the relationship between God and his creator and his creation um 
and is uh, like by no means just follows from Christian philosophy in any particular way. Oh, by the way, I meant to mention this before. What um, if we say that science, uh, sorry, Christianity is necessary of science, then we have to ask what branch of Christianity? Is it Protestantism? Is it Catholicism? What about like uh, Eastern Orthodoxy or Oriental Orthodoxy? Um, the Eastern Orthodox world, particularly like say Russia, uh, was backward in many ways, economically and scientifically for a long time. Um, and it doesn't seem that their Christian viewpoint had, you know, the same impetus towards the scientific revolution. Now, of course you could say, but there's a million differences between that. They were like less connected with the rest of Europe and at least until sort of Peter the Great and, you know, they had served them for so much longer and that impeded them economically and they had like despotic uh, leaders for a long time. But yeah, that's the that's the point I'm making. <laughs> that's the same reason why you can't just say, oh, because they were Christian in Western Europe in the 17th century, therefore that led to the scientific revolution. But then you say, well, they were Christian in the 17th century in in Russia as well. And for that matter, they were Christian for a long time before that in Russia, uh, and no scientific revolution. Or like the Byzantine Empire for for centuries, no scientific revolution. The whole thing makes no sense. It's just entire post hoc rationalization, cherry picking the things you like, ignoring the evidence that you don't like. Uh, like like we more readily recognise in music and art and some of those other things, and say, wow, you know, let's not lose sight that this is pointing us beyond. When you do science properly, it's pointing you beyond. It, it's not reductionist um, in the sense that uh, it's taking meaning away. It should be adding meaning on. Wow, we can. That's exactly what people were worried about in the 17th century. As we just saw with Thomas Hobbes, like, oh, you're taking the wonder out of nature. You, you, there's no room for God anymore. So th this this concern has been around for a very long time. Do this stuff. We can actually analyse nature and understand it and learn something about um, the author of nature. So I would encourage your uh, audience who are Christians um, to go and read some really good geeky science books, right? Read people, some of the best science communicators out there, people like Sean. Um, if any of your audience are Christians and they haven't been interested in science or they've got a marginal interest in science, perhaps what they need to do is go and buy a really good science book by a really good science communicator like Sean Carroll or, or somebody like that. And, and think, you know what? This is all God's idea. This science stuff is God's idea. And if I really read through it, I can be kind of transported into the transcendental. It was such a good idea that God only gave it to us in the 17th century after at least, at least let's say, 4,700 years of civilization, if you say date it to 3,000 BC, which is a kind of a standard dating. So, I mean, it was such a good idea that God just decided, you know what? They can wait 4,700 years to get it. Interestingly, Christianity was also such a good idea that we had to, had to wait 3,000 years to get it, but that's a different that's a different story. Just like I can when I listen to some really amazing music, or I go to an art gallery and I see an amazing portrait, or I go to the theatre and I see an amazing play, or I go out into the countryside and I see an incredible view. Um, you know, God, science is wonderful, and to really I agree with that. enjoy it, um, you've got to see it as a gift from oh. God and rejoice in it. That's what I would say. It's like the first half of every sentence is like, yes, I agree, and then the second half is, oh, <laughs> you, you don't need God to enjoy science. Uh, in fact, I think you enjoy it more without God because you, you don't have this idea that, well, like, but where's the miracle or well, like, you know, where does God fit into this? It, th this, this notion seems to be something that a lot of Christians who uh, believe in science or like science or do science uh, can struggle with this. Like, but where does, like, what's God doing if I can explain this all mechanistically? And of course there's always going to be gaps and things we don't understand. So you can always put God there, but, but that, that really seems to be a worry for a lot of people. And if you're a naturalist, you don't have this idea. Like, no, that's just, that's just what it is. <laughs> what it, It's almost like saying, Science is not enough because there has to be something beyond the science for it to like make the science interesting or important or whatever. But no, the science itself, our understanding of the natural world, that is cool. That is amazing. That is, um, you know, invigorating and, and liberating and, and um, enlightening and so forth. It, it doesn't need to point somewhere else beyond that uh, to something mystical that we can't understand for it to have those properties. I, I, I think that that's just a really bad way to think about it. Well, I've got about a thousand more questions and things that I'd like to talk with you guys about, but we're out of time. So we're going to let both of uh, Tom and Dave go be with their families. They're in the UK right now, so it's late over there. And uh, in, in the US over here, it's only 1.20 in the afternoon. So, uh, but anyways, in, in any case, thank you guys both for coming on. Uh, I really enjoyed the book and I, I recommend that you pick it up as well. Again, I've got it linked in the description. I'll put it on the screen one more time. Science, let there be science. Why God loves science and science needs God. They make a, a really compelling case, I would say, in this book. There's a lot of cool things in here as well, science-y type things. If you're into science at all, there's a lot of great stuff. So in any case, thank you guys. Uh, thank, thank both of you for taking time out of your day. Sciencey things. All right. I think that's, wait, gee, I nearly pressed the wrong button again. All right. <laughs> I'll get the hang of it eventually. So that's what I wanted to look at uh, today. So let's just have a brief recap. Uh, first of all, don't buy that book. Uh, if you're interested in the relationship between science and religion, I recommend this one. This is quite a good book. I mean, there's others as well. This is an anthology. It covers, you know, many of the big issues, um, including, 
the development of science, scientific revolution, um, Darwinism and evolution, um, development of responses to those in different religious traditions, and uh, relationship between theology and modern science, you know, scientific argument and design argument and so forth. Um, so uh, that or similar sources are a good, uh, a good resource for this. This is where you're going to get solid scholarship about the connections between theology and history and, and development of science. Also, you can look at uh, philosophy of science, which is related. We kind of touched on some of these areas. If you're interested in a book recommendation there, this is sort of, this is actually an older version now. There's a newer edition, which I don't have. Philosophy of science, the central issues. This is kind of like the, I was going to say Bible, but maybe that's not appropriate. The go-to the go book for this or one of them. Um, there's a lot of stuff here that we didn't, we didn't go through, but a few of the things mentioned. I, I don't actually know if they talk about the new experimentalism here. I guess that's maybe uh maybe a bit more recent than this book actually but uh like realism and uh and instrumentalism is one thing that was mentioned there so um that would be another sort of resource um uh i'll, I'll post the title of these books in the um description of the video actually it's probably more useful um yeah i probably should do actually that i'll i'll get around to that at some point um I, I i guess i like to add recommendations as a kind of a counter to the recommendations that you'll often see in these videos, which is often why I like to do that, because I don't generally like to recommend, I mean, I recommend my own book. I mean, I've, I've kind of got to do that right. Uh, but apart from that, I generally don't like to recommend books that have an ax to grind. I like to recommend sort of mainstream scholarly works, or at least anthologies that have people from different points of view, because I don't think it's good to just read books from people who always reinforce your worldview, which certain apologists or popularizers in shall not be named, maybe have a tendency to do. Um, so that's why I recommend these works here who are not by people who are trying to um, make a particular argument. They're just, this is just like good scholarship in this area. Um, anyway, so the sort of TLDR of what we're talking about here is science does not require God because you can do science without any particular hypothesis about God, or even I would argue natural laws is irrelevant for most scientific purposes. Even fundamental physics, which is the strongest case, I don't think you actually need that. At most, you can just see what you're doing is um, you can make the hypothesis that there's going to be regularities and then you can develop a theory on that. You can test that and, and that validates the theory. You don't have to just sort of accept it on faith or anything like that. And we actually have very good reasons now for why we think that there's uniformity of nature, which goes into um, Noether's theorem and um, translational and other invariances, which for those who know about this, you'll know what I'm talking about. For those who don't, maybe we'll talk about it another time. So we, we don't have to take that on faith. It's just silly. Um, and Dave and others were unable to give any cogent reasons as to what exactly the, the difference uh, belief in these philosophical or theological underpinnings makes for any scientific practice today. So that's just rubbish. The other point was that you needed a, that, that certain theological beliefs were necessary for science to start to get off the ground. Um, and we showed that that was at best highly oversimplified and probably more fairly just flat out wrong in um, some of the discussions that I went through in terms of the mechanical philosophy uh, that was critical for development of scientific revolution in 17th century Europe. Um, the work of people like Thomas Hobbes, um, Boyle, um, Descartes, and uh, Galileo, and a few others, um, and how they were basically interacting with um, different views, including like Epicureanism, which was an ancient Greek philosophy, which was essentially me me mechanistic and material, um, and rejecting scholasticism, which was the existing Christian theological sort of mainstream, but trying to reconcile those and try to not to be too materialistic, which is what Hobbes was accused of, um, and um, you know, drawing on theological and, and other perspectives as well, trying to integrate these ideas of mathematizability of nature and um, the importance of empirical experimental results, um, both of which is not really clear how you get that from the Bible in any particular way. This is a particular theological approach and not something that's just derivable from scripture. We can see this from the fact that Christianity was so good for the development of science, but it had to wait like 1400 years for it to happen. And it didn't happen in, you know, the, um, uh, in, in the Eastern world, like in Russia or, or even in the Byzantine empire. No, it, they were Christian, but wasn't sufficient there. Apparently you needed, it's like the, you need the right kind of Christianity, which is interesting. Um, although most of these early writers like Descartes and um, I think who was, I think, oh, I'm not sure about Boyle, but a bunch of them were Catholics as well. So I'm not sure if that counts as the right brand of Christianity according to these guys. So I, I don't know about that, but anyway, um, also we, we talked about how in the Islamic world and in the, the, um, the Chinese uh, dynasties, particularly the Tang and the Sung dynasties, there was a great deal of what we might call proto-scientific or and technological development that um, seemed to proceed without any requirement of the greater in the Christian sense. And the Islamic world had a belief in the greater themselves, actually. So 
Um, now, they didn't have an scientific revolution. The reasons for that are varied and complicated and probably have little to nothing to do with the theological underpinnings, although you can't be certain about this because there's so many factors. But, I mean, Dave doesn't know. Dave, <laughs> Dave didn't even talk about this. Uh, and even though I know there are some Christians who argue this more, uh, sort of more carefully, I, I still don't think anyone knows, knows the answer to that. And I think that it's it's pretty implausible that, that those are major contributing factors because we talked about the importance of, you know, the political factors and the commercial factors and the technological aspect and the feedback with um, with scientific results and experimentalism and, and mathematical developments as well with the mathematizability. So there's, there's so many factors going on here. Did they need Christianity? Um, almost certainly not even though a bunch of the earliest, well, almost all of the earliest, um, so, you know, develop, developers of science were Christians. Of course, you had to be. <laughs> it kind of wasn't optional at that point. Um, but, I mean, yeah, sure, it, it, made a, it made a difference. And people like Descartes, for example, thought that what they were doing was honoring God. But that doesn't mean, just because it was there, doesn't mean that it was necessary. Just because you put an ingredient in the soup doesn't mean it's necessary for the soup, right? And, and I think that... Um, the biggest, the best candidate for what was necessary was something like a mechanical philosophy, and that is an ancient Greek idea. It's not a Christian idea, um, and it was in contra it contradicted with the the sort of prevailing Aristotelianism, near Aristotelianism that prevailed at the day. So the whole argument's bunk. Christianity didn't need science to originate, and um, Christianity doesn't. Uh, sorry, science doesn't. I think I said that wrong around. Science doesn't need Christianity to originate, and science doesn't need Christianity today or any particular theistic worldview for that matter. Uh, welcome, Nathan. You arrived just in time for the end of the stream. So thanks, everyone, for uh, for coming. Hopefully you found this interesting. This, I mean, science is really interesting to me. I've got a Science of Everything podcast, which you should check out, um, where I talk about science, um, and science really informs my worldview. So I don't like it when people uh, abuse science or um, appeal to it to, uh, like, like to try to substantiate um you know, worldviews like Christianity, which I think have little to do with science intrinsically, and particularly when they make miss, when they abuse the um, scholarly literature and and just make unsubstantiated claims about the relation between science, Christianity, and, and the historical origins of that. So, um, yeah, that particularly gets to me. So, hopefully, you found this interesting. Um, check in soon for more of these sorts of uh, counter apologetics videos. Thanks again, everyone, and talk to you then. See ya. Oops.